On the morning of September 11, 2001, 19 men armed with box cutters directed by a man on dialysis in a cave fortress halfway around the world using a satellite phone and a laptop directed the most sophisticated penetration of the most heavily defended airspace in the world. Overpowering the passengers and the military combat trained pilots on four commercial aircraft before flying those planes wildly off course for over an hour without being molested by a single fighter interceptor. These 19 hijackers, devout religious fundamentalists who like to drink alcohol, snort cocaine, and live with pink-haired strippers, managed to knock down three buildings with two planes in New York. While in Washington, a pilot who couldn't handle a single-engine Cessna was able to fly a 757 in an 8,000-foot descending 270-degree corkscrew turn to come exactly level with the ground, hitting the Pentagon in the Budget Analyst Office where DOD staffers were working on the mystery of the $2.3 trillion that Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld had announced missing from the Pentagon's coffers in a press conference the day before, on September 10th, 2001. Luckily, the news anchors knew who did it within minutes. Osama bin Laden. The pundits knew within hours. Osama bin Laden. The administration knew within the day. Terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. And the evidence literally fell into the FBI's lap. That a hijacker's passport was found blocks from the World Trade Center crash site, if you can believe that. But for some reason, a bunch of crazy conspiracy theorists demanded an investigation into the greatest attack on American soil in history. That investigation was delayed, underfunded, set up to fail, a conflict of interest, and a cover-up from start to finish. It was based on testimony extracted through torture, the records of which were destroyed. It failed to mention the existence of WTC-7, Able Danger, p -Tech, Sibel Edmonds, OBL and the CIA, and the drills of hijacked aircraft being flown into buildings that were being simulated at the precise same time that those events were actually happening. It was lied to by the Pentagon, the CIA, the Bush administration, and as for Bush and Cheney, well, no one knows what they told it because they testified in secret, off the record, not under oath, and behind closed doors. It didn't bother to look at who funded the attacks because that question is ultimately of little practical significance. Still, the 9-11 Commission did brilliantly answering all of the questions the public had, except most of the victim's family members' questions, and pinned blame on all the people responsible, although no one so much as lost their job, determining the attacks were failure of imagination because nobody in our government at least, and I don't think the prior government that could envision flying airplanes into buildings. Except the Pentagon, FEMA, NORAD, and the NRO. The DIA destroyed 2.5 terabytes of data on Able Danger, but that's okay because it probably wasn't important. The SEC destroyed their records on the investigation into the insider trading before the attacks, but that's okay because destroying the records of the largest investigation in SEC history is just part of routine record keeping. NIST has classified the data that they used for their model of WTC7's collapse, but that's okay because knowing how they made their model of the collapse would jeopardize public safety. The FBI has argued that all material related to their investigation of 9-11 should be kept secret from the public, but that's okay because the FBI probably has nothing to hide. This man never existed, nor is anything he had to say worthy of your attention, and if you say otherwise, you are a paranoid conspiracy theorist and deserve to be shunned by all of humanity. Likewise him, 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 and her. And her, and her, and him. Osama bin Laden lived in a cave fortress in the hills of Afghanistan, but somehow got away. Then he was hiding out in Tora Bora, but somehow got away. Then he lived in Abbottabad for years, taunting the most comprehensive intelligence dragnet employing the most sophisticated technology in the history of the world for a decade, releasing video after video with complete impunity and getting younger and younger as he did so, before finally being found in a daring SEAL team raid which wasn't recorded on video, in which he didn't resist or use his wife as a human shield, and in which these crack special forces operatives panicked and killed this unarmed man, supposedly the best source of intelligence about those dastardly terrorists on the entire planet. Then they dumped his body in the ocean before telling anyone about it. Then a couple dozen of that team's members died in a helicopter crash in Afghanistan. This is the story of 9-11, brought to you by the media which told you the hard truths about His head could be seen to move violently forward. And They took the babies out of incubators. And Mobile production facilities. And The rescue of Jessica Lynch. If you have any questions about this story, you are a batshit, paranoid, tinfoil, dog-abusing baby hater, and will be reviled by everyone. If you love your country and or freedom, happiness, rainbows, rock and roll, puppy dogs, apple pie, and your grandma, you will never ever express doubts about any part of this story to anyone. Ever. This has been a public service announcement by the friends of the FBI, CIA, NSA, DIA, SEC, MSM, White House, NIST, and the 9-11 Commission. Because ignorance is strength. What's up, revolutionaries? DC with you here on Project Sanity, a very special broadcast, a special show here on 9-11. Uh, I've convinced my cohorts to uh, join me today and uh, discuss 
the 15th anniversary that uh, his, the History Channel will call it 15 Septembers later in their yearly installment of the propaganda. And uh, it took a little convincing, not much really, but a little convincing uh, to get my, uh, my cohorts together today and uh, put a little maybe sanity into the conversation about 9-11 uh, and um, the, uh, the, re what the, the narrative. We have a big thing on this show about narrative. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the narrative, which you just saw, thanks to James Corbett of the Corbett Report. Uh, I don't know if you uh, are familiar with James, but uh, I'll have his website up here in a minute. But uh, and he may may be joining us actually in this hour, uh, possibly. We'll see. I, I we put as I said we pulled this show together a little. You know we do a lot haphazardly here on Project Sanity because we're just putting it all together. And we've got uh, I'm going to bring him up here. I had it all ready to go, and here they are. Here are my my partners in this crime today. Uh, playing uh, on Project Sanity is Richard Green, a regular co-host here and creator of Project Sanity, as well as Eric Miller up there in uh, Tacoma, Washington. Is that correct? No, I'm sorry, Olympia. You're in Olympia. Adair's in Tacoma. Very good. Sorry, my friend. Uh, but uh, you're all up in Washington, right? You're all up in the great state of Washington. And uh, I thank you guys for joining me today. Richard, uh, Eric, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, that was, of course, what we saw there was a, uh, a video came out a number of years ago, I think a few years ago, by uh, uh, the Corbett Report. James Corbett put that out. He, uh, he started his website uh, in 2004 or 2007. He's been in Japan since 2004. But he, saw, he started his website in uh, 2007, and he basically is an independent journalist, you know, trying to break the corporate media um, lock on information and puts out a lot of really good information that, uh, you know, some would call conspiracy theory in some mainstream circles, in many circles, actually, which, and, but also was a creation of the CIA. We all know the term conspiracy theory was created by the theorists. And that really is ultimately part of the show today is that we are being asked to, uh, to believe a conspiracy theory that uh, we just saw that 19 guys hijacked four planes and flew, flew them, in, flew them into uh, buildings or, you know, across the most heavily guarded and protected airspace uh, on the planet. So uh, just uh, welcome, gentlemen. Um, I, know, I know I drag you into this. And Eric, you have some background. Eric's like, oh, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm on board, man. I'm on board. I know, uh, you know we both questioned this story from the very beginning. Richard, what's your story a little bit about uh, your... How, how, what's your concept of this narrative? What's your, what's your thoughts on this narrative and uh, some of the alternate things, alternate uh, possibilities that people are talking about? Uh, well, uh, I guess I, I do want to start just because uh, we all deal with the, the trauma of 9-11 in different ways. And I know like uh, people have a lot of different opinions about what transpired and how to feel about the, the victims that, that were more, most clearly uh, the victims of this attack. And uh, so I just want to, you know, uh, it's 15 years later, but, you know, for all those families, you know, I just my my, I guess, best feelings or whatever towards them. And that I don't mean in any way to be disrespectful or to be dismissive of anything that that they went through as in the transpiring of our conversation. Well, that's uh, certain. I mean, that certainly is a reasonable comment. And I'm, I'm remiss by not remembering that. I mean, many, much of this research. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm a little nervous that uh, we have these. We have two amazing guests today about this subject, the subject that I've been very interested in for a long time. But Richard, you're absolutely right. A lot, of, and a lot of this research comes from uh, people who suffered the tragedy of 9/11 and and refuse to give up uh, to find the truth. So absolutely, I mean, I, you know, it, it's it's part of how they got us or getting us. You know, there's talk today about. You know how the FBI was heard saying that they still didn't do enough. They still didn't kill enough people. You know, to get really on you know on people on board this this plan of global, uh, you know, uh, hegemony. Uh, but you know, all rumors. But absolutely, these people did die. You know, there were people, many people that died on 9/11, and um, I think that has a lot to do with why people don't really want to look, maybe at the truth or even look for the truth. Um, you know, based on their, on their, on their, on the tragedy and their feelings for it. Yeah. And, uh, and to kind of address your, the question that you asked, uh, I guess my, my current position 
on 9-11. I guess I'm probably going to fall as more skeptical of what we're going to be hearing today than, than either of you two, but uh, I also am skeptical of the story I've been told about what happened on 9-11 and as was uh, laid out in the video that we opened with, some of the subsequent events. And uh, for me, having the opportunity to be able to look over the last 15 years of what's transpired, what's come out, rather than in the immediate moment of 9-11 and then the post afterwards and the consolidation and patriotism and all that kind of stuff, without that cloak around what actually transpired, being able to take a more sober look at what tra what happened uh, both on 9-11 before it and then in the 15 years since. And so that that's what I'm particularly interested in that. And then I've been also doing some research on... Uh, the Trade Center, World Trade Center Building 7, which I think we're going to be talking about later on in the show, that uh, it's raised some interesting questions to myself for myself that I haven't haven't been answered to my satisfaction. Well, you know, Trade Center 7 was always has always really been the smoking gun for me. Um, you know, I even would say for the last number of years, I would say, okay, I'll buy your Trade Center, your Twin Towers story, but I can't buy what's going on at Trade World Trade Center 7. And yeah, we're going to be talking to uh, Ted Walter, a representative of the architects and engineers uh, for truth about 9-11 uh, in our uh, 6.30 to 7 half hour. So let people know that he's going to be joining us and he's going to give us an update on the current state of that, uh, their, their, uh, uh, their effort and uh, what they're looking at. They're looking, they're trying to look at the whole picture, of course, but uh, what is the most obvious is World Trade Center 7. And there is currently a new study going on, relatively new. It's a two-year study going on up at the University of Alaska. So uh, we have a little video I'll show about that, but uh, and we'll talk to him later. But uh, Eric, uh, where, where, where do you come from? Uh, and I know you and I sort of were uh, from the very beginning questioning it and um, gave it up a little bit. So where are you at this today and on this uh, 15th September? So again, I, I know we've kind of hashed over it uh, already, but I, I would like to say that none of what I believe at all um, is to say that the victims of this tragedy uh, are not victims and that my condolences do not lie with them. Um, so first first of all, I just have to get that out as well. Um, but Dave, I, I go back and forth, man. Um, there's a lot of times, you know, I've, I've studied this a lot. And to be honest, the data and evidence all shows me that the uh, truther movement has truth to it. Um, but the government tells me that I'm crazy and uh, everybody around me tells me that I'm crazy. And it's one of those situations that even though I'm, I'm looking at the data and the evidence that shows me, okay, well, this had to have been a, an act that was more organized than a couple of guys who couldn't speak English and had no income um, that suddenly came into our country and were able to pull off one of the biggest terrorist uh, attacks in our country's history um questionably uh the biggest terrorist attack because pearl harbor was an act of war um so it, it's it's been difficult for me to decide really where i stand i know for sure that i don't believe uh what the government has fed to us i don't believe what mainstream media has fed to us i know that there's answers out there that we still have not been given i know that oh oh sorry 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 so thought I heard myself for a second there. Um, but I, I know that for some reason um, in the 9-11 report, they chose to not release the pages that included Saudi Arabia until the last few months. Um, so almost four, or almost 15 years after uh, the incident occurred. I know that uh, as you kind of touched on already, Dave, uh, that building number seven is the biggest question of all. I know that my grandpa worked at Boeing and even as an evangelical Christian conservative, he has verified that there is no way a Boeing 747 fit through that hole in the Pentagon. I know that the location uh, uh, of the Pentagon that was hit uh, just happened to be where they were trying to, as, as uh, pointed out in the video that you showed before we started talking, just happened to be where they were doing the research, trying to figure out where the uh, trillions of dollars disappeared. Um, where the money went. So I guess a, a more summarization, a better summarization of how I feel about all this. Um, I feel like there's more answers uh, to what the truthers have to say than what the mainstream media has to say. Uh, well, you know, that's, I think, part of how they get us to look away, you know, um, 
the truther, the whole truther label, uh, you know, that's a psyop. I can, you know, it just looks like a psy. You know, it's basically anybody who is seeking. The, how is seeking the truth become a crazy concept? Yeah. Right. Oh, you know, they're just a truther. You know. <laughs> We're yeah. seeing it reinforced in our current campaigns, but I don't want to diverge too much. But well, uh, you know, I mean, it's you know, that's they're both they're both bought and paid for. You know, I mean, this was um, part of you know he you know and just uh, Donald Trump in his is uh, what is a foreign policy speech he gave right before the forum. Uh, he's basically laid out we need to get our you know get everybody get on board with their GDP buying military. We need to increase buy more ships, increase this, increase that. So the neocons have him right there. He's like, here you go, this is what we want. And so he's got you know they're getting him in there. Um, but uh, Hillary is you know bought and paid for neocon, and we're going we're going to war, and they're setting us up. I mean just. Just look. I mean, it's it's a one long trail from 1979 and the invasion of Afghanistan by the Soviet Union, the draw-in of Afghanistan, all the way to where we're at today. And ISIS is at the very end of that trail uh, that was paid for, trained, fomented all the way along with the CIA. I mean, we're fighting. You know, Al Qaeda is fighting uh, ISIS in Aleppo. Poor Gary Johnson. <laughs> Ob- obviously, got way too high before he went on Morning Joe that morning. And it's like, dude, what's Aleppo? I don't know. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, so we have, you know, it's, it's the, C- the CIA good. fighting the FBI in Syria. And, uh, you know, we're arming the good rebels, which always turn out to be more, you know, the moderate rebels, which always turn out to be bad guys. You know, uh, where do they get their money? We get And their equipment? We gave it to them. <laughs> you know, whether they stole it from the Iraqi army or, you know, uh, we gave it to them. So and, you know, Aleppo is just the next uh, mainstream media spin to get us into the war, to get us into the war. We're bombing kids all over the place. You know, I, I, I can find a bunch of pictures of, of Gaza right now, too. We got kids, kids and us sitting on brick covered in dust, all kinds of video of that. So, you know, we're killing kids everywhere, this military machine. And... Uh, so Aleppo is just the next, you know, teeing us up just like they teed us up for Iraq, you know, and we can go back to them, you know, stealing the election even, you know, so, but I digress. We are here to talk about, you know, less conspiratorial things and we can expand, of course, but uh, we're, let's focus a little bit on Building 7. Uh, we know we've been, you know, this is sort of something, okay, here's a couple of assumptions. Let's make a couple of assumptions, guys. A crime was committed on 9-11. Can we Correct. can we assume that? Yes. That this was a crime that was committed one way or another. Yep. It certainly was a crime up until the time they attacked uh, the Pentagon, because that's basically when it became an act of war. Yes. Um, and a matter of fact, that's one of the theories is that they couldn't have attacked, uh, they couldn't have gotten everybody involved unless the Pentagon was attacked, a military target was attacked, because then it could actually be an act of war and yada yada. The Pearl. It's funny you mentioned Pearl Harbor which is exactly what the Project for a New American Century needed in order to do what they're doing. So uh, that was a big, speaking of narrative, that was a narrative that was very much uh, going on in the early, early months of the Bush administration during confirmation hearings, doing a lot of things. They were talking Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor. So eh, prima facie evidence. So here we have a crime that essentially has had no real investigation. I think another assumption we can make, and even the commissioners on the 9-11 Commission say that their, their report was underfunded, uh, stall, you know, tried to, they, stopped, they tried to stop it at every angle, um, and that it was basically a whitewash. Even they admit to that. So we basically have a crime that has not been properly investigated. Can we, would we agree on that? I agree, totally. Uh, so, well, go ahead, Richard. I think that's a reasonable. Uh, oh, I I can't say that I'm fully aware of the depth of the investigation, but uh, I I think that's we. It certainly wasn't reported in a way that I think detailed it. Uh, so so here's to the level that you're. Well, they even admit. I mean, they even admit to it. I mean, like FEMA's like, we yeah. don't know. We're gonna leave it to NIST. Uh, you yeah. know, NIST finally had to admit the felt you know free fall. So you know, and the commission basically says you know this was not complete. They don't even touch Building Seven, which is. You know, really interesting. Go ahead, Eric. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I just wanted to point out yeah. with, with normal investigations, you don't start the investigation off 
with uh, a person, with one single person or one single group or one single country, with most criminal investigations, in order for the investigation to be fair and to make sure that you're finding all the facts, you don't start off with just one person or one country. Um, and, and that's what we've done here with 9-11. It was always, oh, OK, uh, the Taliban or Al Qaeda or, or you know, I, I even forget who, who their target was uh, in this particular instance. Um, but the investigation did not leave things open for, for anything other than um, who they were targeting and who they already assumed in the end. Right. So instead of actually investigating what happened, they tried what the investigation did was try to find clues that made it made their story more viable well which rather is, than actually investigating what happened which is what they did to get us into iraq so it's yeah. like it's the mo is right there you know and actually that is the case the uh we know that that uh Zelikow, uh i think that's how you pronounce his name who basically took over for kissinger as the chairman of the 9-11 commission which was a joke <laughs> um he basically was worse because nobody really knew about him uh, that he'd actually written this story of not of the trade towers being hit in 1998 uh but he basically had an outline of how the commission report would be and we know this now that there yeah. was an outline that basically said this is what it's going to be guys fill in the blanks and uh that's basically what they did they had an assumption that this is what we're going to story is and we need to we need to find the evidence that's going to plug that in and the evidence they have for NIST, uh, for seven, no wonder they didn't put Building Seven in the damn <laughs> report. It's because the evidence is blatantly wrong. <laughs> so I'm going to go to. Uh, let me just let's go to this video. I need a little water because you know I'm talking like crazy. But let me go to this video. Uh, this is about a funny statistic. Funny statistic uh, on 9/11 is uh, that recently a poll was done. I don't know the exact date, but that 42% of Americans did not know that Building Seven, a third building, came down in. Manhattan. <laughs> you say a third? Forty-two percent. Wait, 42%. no. Oh, wait, wait. I thought Richard was just like, wait, a third building fell down. I'm no, like, Richard, yeah, a third you know, building, a third yeah, building yeah, fell you know, down. The one we're talking about. Yeah, two. You're like a smart person, man. I know you're smarter than I am. I, mean, I, I was distracted by Dave uh, putting the video up, so I was like, I didn't hear the actual right. number. The percentage. I just and so I was I, like a third. That sounds pretty good. Like if it was th only a third of us didn't like weren't aware. No, uh, yeah, uh, almost but half. Still Forty-two percent. Not that bad. As bad as I would think in general for the American population. But I think that shows that what happened on 9/11, as although we're told never to forget, uh, we didn't really even know in the first place. Right. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh no, we didn't know anything. I mean, they got that evidence out of there so fast. The video of Giuliani's the dump trucks. He even bragging yeah. about how they got 120 dump trucks of stuff out because he wanted to open up downtown. Great investigation, guys. Not one investigative principle was followed in this in this crime, whether it be a crash of an airplane or the or the uh, the collapse of a building. Every, every evidential and step of investigation was completely disregarded and 9-11, uh, 9-11. So let's go to that. I'm going to go to that video and I'm going to get... Before you play the video, I just wanted to say that's actually an important point that you bring up the, uh, yeah, about ahead. investigation. Essentially, we were that, the downtown New York was a murder scene. Yes. And you, 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 as you pointed out, he was bragging about removing 120 tons of evidence. Yep. Yes. Well, that's exactly. one of the, we're going to play another video, and if James joins us, we'll talk about it, but he has a series out this week about 9-11 suspects, alternative suspects to 9-11 of who were behind this, and Giuliani's one of them. Maybe we'll play that if we have a, for a little break. Uh, we'll give us all a break, but uh, I want to watch this one. Uh, this is a, it's about a five-minute video, uh, but this is basically, uh, this is the official Rethink 9-11 uh, video, and uh, here we go. At approximately 5.20 p.m., a tower fell on 9-11. Did you know that a third tower fell on 9-11? At approximately 5.20 p.m. on September 11, 2001, World Trade Center Building 7 collapsed in 6.5 seconds from normal office fires, according to the government's final report. World Trade Center 7 collapsed because of fires fueled by office furnishings. It did not collapse from explosives or from fuel oil fires. Later, the government finally admitted that Building 7 collapsed at the rate of freefall after trying to deny it. 
So what's wrong with a building in free fall? What is free fall? It's just like taking your car keys out and just dropping them. That's how fast the building came down for over 100 feet. This is high school physics. A building cannot do free fall with 40,000 tons of structural steel in its structural system without it being blown up. It's the only way that a building can accelerate as it collapses is by having pre-engineered, precisely timed and precisely placed explosives. In other words, controlled demolition. Normal office fires not only dropped a steel-framed skyscraper for the first time in history, and did so at freefall, according to the government's report. They also burned hot enough to create the molten metal observed at ground zero. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel, like molten down. steel running down the channel rails, like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. In an office fire, you cannot generate enough heat to melt steel. So if you have a flame at 750 degrees, you can hold that flame under a steel beam forever and you'll never reach a high enough temperature to bend steel, let alone melt it. First of all, let's go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of melt molten steel. Like lava. Like, like, like lava from a volcano. Um, I know of absolutely nobody, no eyewitness who said so, nobody who's produced it. John Gross categorically denied their observations. He not only ignored evidence, he denied evidence. The government acknowledged that Building 7's collapse was unprecedented. Engineers were also stunned. Yet somehow, news networks and many others knew it was going to happen. CNN reported the collapse an hour before it happened. We are getting information now that one of the other buildings, Building 7, in the World Trade Center complex is on fire and has either collapsed or is collapsing. And a few blocks away. Now, more on the latest building collapse in New York. The BBC even reported the collapse in detail, live from New York, over 20 minutes before it happened, with Building 7 still standing in the background. Immediately after Building 7's collapse, FDNY Lieutenant David Rastuccio had this to say. We had heard reports that the building was unstable and that it eventually would either come down on its own or it would be taken down. CBS veteran anchorman Dan Rather and others also had their first impressions, which were only broadcast on that tragic day. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. And I turned in time to see uh, what looked like uh, a skyscraper implosion. It looked like it had been done by a demolition crew. The whole thing just collapsing down on itself. You don't need to be an engineer or an architect to see what happened to those buildings. The most obvious hypothesis for anyone looking at the films is that the buildings came down because there was very carefully controlled demolition with high explosives that had been planted weeks if not months before. 9-11 claimed thousands of lives and touched millions more. It led us into two wars and was used to scale back our civil liberties and invade our privacy. But many people are beginning to question what we were told and we are demanding answers. So how do we do it? We find our own voices and then we raise them, together. There's been hatred, there's been fear, but there's been no justice for the people who were killed on that day. We must have an inquiry to find out what really happened. The official accounts of 9-11 are false. This is so important that you've got, to, you've got to put your usual sources on hold for a while. You take it slowly, just slowly digest it, slowly accept it. When the most likely hypothesis in, in the case of Building 7 wasn't even mentioned. They didn't talk about Building 7. Nobody mentioned it. And it wasn't hit by planes. So why did it go down? What I want to persuade you to do is look into it, right? And make up your own mind. Rethink 9-11. Rethink 9-11! Australia supports. Join us and millions around the world who are now learning about the evidence and uniting to rethink 9-11.
Yeah. No, 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 you're good. Yeah, Sorry, no. guys, I'm uh, plugging in. One of the most important things I think that points out is that we need to rethink 9-11. And uh, another lesson we can learn from that is that um, yeah, there's a lot of things we need to rethink. And <laughs> they tell us that we wear tinfoil hats all the time. Um, a recent example. Turns out Alex, Hillary is sick. Yeah, there's that. <laughs> Or, or it turns out that the DNC did collaborate right. against Bernie yeah. Sanders. Oh, yeah, there's that. Oh, but, but Dave, you were crazy when you said it before. Yeah, we're nuts. You were crazy. You still got your tinfoil hat. Yep. You must. <laughs> yep, I do. That's how it looked like tinfoil, yeah. <laughs> In my upside-down flag, man. It's We got some, you know, oh, yeah, we, uh, you know, because, listen, you know, uh, what did this thing do? What did this, what did this crime accomplish? It, first of all, it parlayed itself into another crime, that they used the same M.O. to lie us into, which was the war in Iraq, which which created this entire chaos, which is what they were yes. looking for. I mean, they had motive. They have motives. They had they told us what their motives were. The guys that took over the government on on in November of 2000 through a coup uh, basically wrote us wrote a, a, a plan that said, we here's what we're going to do. We're going to build up our military. America's going to the project for a new American century it says it all right there. And it says we need a new Pearl Harbor. So they either planned it, executed it, capitalized on it, or something in between. You know, we know they knew something was coming. Richard Clark knew. Uh, Bush knew. You know, uh, they practiced. You know, we could, who could have thought? That's the thing. Condoleezza Rice, and they came out there and just said, "Who could have thought?" And we all went, "Yeah, who could have thought?" Turns out, everyone in the intelligence industry thought about planes crashing into the Pentagon and the Dave, world what, and the World Trade Center. What was the um, there was some kind of manual that actually had a picture of right. a plane crashing into the World Trade Centers uh, that was released yeah. shortly before. Um, I don't, and then you, it's funny you bring up Condoleezza Rice because she called and I know you know his name, um, a mayor in California the night before and Willie told him Brown, not to fly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's you know, that's the thing. There's there's plenty there's plenty of prima facie evidence that a, cr a, real, a crime was committed and that there is no real you know if you look at you know if a jury is going to start looking at this evidence if you don't have a body uh which is basically what they did with the uh, the towers was get rid of the body um turns out they didn't get rid of all the bodies because they're still they were still finding them on tops of buildings years later that nice work giuliani and uh, uh you know so they did destroyed the evidence whitewashed the investigation and marched us off into global unending war which oh and they treated the survivors like shit oh christine uh, todd especially whitman the first responders <laughs> especially the first responders you know if and think about that if these guys did just turn their back and not do anything and not scramble airplanes and you know just waited for an attack to happen and just let them march in there giuliani knew there's video of an interview of Giuliani knew about uh, getting out of Building 7 because they told, oh, why did you evacuate your Office of Emergency Management in the most fortified building, Building 7 again, like we saw, the most fortified building in, in Manhattan where when shit like this goes down, that's where everybody is, where that one gentleman, um, I forget his, his name, but uh, that, was, that he died actually in 2008 under suspicious circumstances because he wouldn't give up, his, well, why he died, but he wouldn't give up his story that he was in the office of man, uh, you know, emergency management. Nobody was there and the coffee was still hot and everybody was gone. And he and another guy were, got out, were trying to get out, an explosion happened and the firemen had to get him out of the eighth floor. So he's dead, that guy. So nobody's around to talk about that anymore. But um, so, you know, we have a, a whole pile of reasons why we should not stop looking at this event, no matter how hurt we are and how in pain we are. The reason we need to do that is because of that. And Chuck, you know, up Chuck Todd this morning, having, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Tom Brokaw on, you know, where, where were you? Um, he made a very interesting Pearl Harbor reference. I'm like, oh, Jesus, they won't give this shit up. Another Pearl Harbor reference, because that was the narrative on how after Pearl Harbor, hey, we weren't thinking about it after the war. It was done. Finished the war. 
you know, moved on, Nuremberg trial, whatever, you know, I mean, you know, timeline, you know, but that was Japan, right? Okay, so war's over. But my point is, we weren't talking about nine, uh, Pearl Harbor 15 years later, right? Here we are, he's like, here we are 15 years later, and we're still being driven by this war. Obama, on August 30th, eh, I'm just re- I'm re-upping the state of emergency that they did 15 years ago, which Congress is supposed to vote on. <laughs> we're still in a state of emergency, guys, in case you don't know. Yeah, and, the author, authorization for use of force. Yeah, <laughs> many years down the road, still and still using it. Congress still, uh, you know, they are absent in their du- derelict in duty. They won't vote on Syria. We found that out. They won't vote on anything. They won't vote on this reauthorization. So, Go ahead, Eric. You mean to tell me that uh, we got out of World War II quicker than we stopped this state of emergency after 9/11? I, I think that's probably true, yeah, because Afghanistan was our longest war. So I don't know, wow. I don't know the exact date, but a tr- you know, exact, exact, but I could probably look that up really quick, or somebody could tell us on YouTube. But I think that's probably accurate. I mean, so, it, it, and it's, you know, uh, the thing is, it's still going on, right? Guess, hey, guess who's running Afghanistan now? The Taliban. Yeah. <laughs> guess who was running Afghanistan then? The Taliban. Oh, what? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what Same dude. Same dude. <laughs> Mula Omar's gone. Mula Omar's gone. And, you know, and, you know, there's, I mean, you know, the Al Qaeda, the base, <laughs> you know, Br- J- Brignev Brzezinski, Mika's dad, Mika's dad, Mika's dad created this problem in Afghanistan, drawing the Soviet Union in. All right. Maybe yeah. he brought down the Soviet Union. But guess what? Uh, blowback. Okay, we got a little blowback happening. If you just want to, even if you, I mean, if you want to call it that, if you want to pigeonhole it into, oh, we'll just call this blowback. Um, but we keep doing it, the stuff that's calling blowback. We don't, you know, we're, oh, they didn't plan for the, the aftermath. We didn't plan for the aftermath in Libya either, uh, no. apparently. Uh, we're, we're not planning for the aftermath, and I guarantee we ain't planning for the aftermath in Syria. Well, it's because regime, regime change does not work. Well, number one, it's not our right to decide who the, president of another country is or the ruler uh when there's human rights violations well i'm saying we go we 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 decided that we didn't like Gaddafi. so and right human rights violations that's an issue but there's other ways to um help fix those problems uh rather than installing our own government that ultimately benefits american corporations and that's what we do yeah we don't install governments because we suddenly feel sympathetic towards human rights violations. We install governments because we see an opportunity to make American corporations more money. And we use them, our military and our private military, you know, that sort of confluence of, uh, of, of, of uh, terms there, you know, the transfer over to actually privatizing the military. They're all over that, um, you know, and the national privatizing the national security state. Uh, so it's all part of it. You know, we can see that. We see that in, at the pipeline. We see that at Dakota. Yes. We see these private security firms of all types, uh, some of the largest ones that are actually literally everywhere in the, on the globe. Um, you, know, uh, you know, where were the real authorities on that day when those dogs were being used? Nowhere to be seen. Well, and you know what's interesting, Dave, uh, is one thing that I didn't even know about until a few days ago um, was the fact that there are so many... Uh, of the wall street big banks that are invested in the pipeline not only do you have these big corporations that are involved in building it but you also have companies like wells fargo bank of america the list goes on and on and on and on that actually are financially affected by uh, what goes on at the pipeline and they're heavily invested in it so when we talk about the evil of these fossil fuel companies yes the fossil fuel companies are evil um, and we know wall street is evil but these guys work together it's not just one man show they're all uh, very diversified, um, and the big banks and Wall Street are very invested in fossil fuels as well. So uh, those guys are fighting together to make sure this shit happens. And yes, I'm happy that Obama um, put a pause on construction. That That is a victory, but this is a war. We're going to have to keep fighting. We're going to have to keep the pressure on. Um, uh, Obama doesn't want a, you know, a bad situation to get worse in his last part of his term. Agreed. You know, uh, they, they, he's just kicked this can down the road uh, for Hillary to take care of if she makes it. You know, I mean, 
uh, talk about interesting times. And you mean that in, one, in more than one way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, but uh, I should but, laugh. I'm sorry. I know. I mean, it's you know that that video. You know, she's not well. If she suffers from deep vein thrombosis, which apparently is why she's on brain uh, blood thinners, traveling around in an airplane is not good for that. I know. I've learned about that. So um, you know, yeah, it's it's. It's uh, kind of scary. This whole six season is scary. And, you know, uh, Donald Trump, you know, one, one, I guess one positive thing that sort of hit the top of my head about Donald Trump is that the Republicans and the Democrats are like, we can't stand this guy. So maybe he's not actually bought and paid for by the military industrial complex. But I don't know. It's starting to look like he's, you know, he basically is the special interest now becoming the government is what that's what that is. So um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, just look at where we are now. Look at us 15 years later. Where are we? We uh, all seven of those, uh, uh, almost all seven of those last two are Syria and Iran of that list that Wesley Clark told us about when he walked into the Pentagon after 9-11. And they say, you know, he said, oh, we're going to go take out Iraq. Uh, and then he talked to a general the next day. And he said, oh, no, it's worse than that. We got seven we're going for a whole list of seven countries. Libya was that one of them. <laughs> the NSA knows your underwear size, Dave. Hey, dude, well, you dude, you know, if they don't have they, a they don't have a file on me. They ain't doing their job. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I did smoke weed on Periscope the other day, so I don't know. Chella, are we committing a federal offense? I don't know. Maybe. maybe. Uh, but uh, me and Gary Johnson, we go. We're like that with that. Uh, but we digress again on this on this very somber day. But you know, we try to. You know, a lot of times, you know, uh, my mother-in-law has Alzheimer's, and then sometimes if you don't laugh, you cry. And um, the absurdity of this story is, you know, they tell us we're, we're conspiracy theorists. We're actually looking at visual evidence that says this building uh, obviously collapsed free fall, which NIST, uh, NIST admits to finally in their, in, their, in their reports showing the graph. They're like, oh, yeah, it was free fall. <laughs> well, what does free fall mean? Well, let's find out what free fall means because uh, I wish Adair was here, and I hope, I hope Adair's feeling okay. Uh, I wish he could have joined us today, tonight, because he is a physicist, and he has promised, actually, to, uh, after a discussion we had, to actually maybe make it this, this project, his project for the semester, is to, is to figure, figure out the physics of this. So that would be great, and maybe he can help out with the University of Alaska and get involved. But um, the architects and engineers for Truth and about 911 uh, we're going to be speaking to uh, uh, Ted Walter later. Uh, he, they have a video about free fall and what it is. So I'm going to queue up this video here. It's ready to go. Well, that's the other one. Uh, but um, it's a very uh, interesting concept and something that uh, all physicists know, certainly engineers know, and that uh, it doesn't really fit into the narrative. <laughs> Essentially, in less than seven seconds, uh, Tower 7 came down upon itself. It's just like taking your car keys out and just dropping them. That's how fast the building came down for over 100 feet. Which, and the only way you can get that is when there is zero resistance. And so what we're looking at is a building just coming straight down, falling right through itself with zero resistance. Buildings don't have zero resistance which is why you feel comfortable walking into a building. This building had 40,000 tons of structural steel in its structural system, and that is intended to keep it from going anywhere. I'd heard people say, well, it came down at free fall or close to free fall and so forth, so I decided I'd measure it myself. I had a simple tool at the time called Physics Toolkit, which allowed me to take a video and put a dot on each frame to follow the motion of things and I realized that it's actually coming down at free fall, pretty much dead on the acceleration of gravity. Well, NIST, in their final draft, was saying that the building came down 40% longer than free fall time. Uh, how can such a publicly visible, easily measurable quantity be set aside? A free fall time would be an object that has no uh, structural components below it. There was a structural resistance that was provided in this particular case. He was making our case for us. You can't have free fall when there's support. And in the final report, 
They modified it and they actually admitted there was a period of freefall involved, but they never changed their model. Like how do you all of a sudden allow for freefall when they just got done explaining how it couldn't have been in freefall? NIST is telling us that the building below it ceased to exist uh, for the first few seconds of the collapse of the building. Well, things in physics just don't cease to exist and cease to resist the forces that are on them. The building didn't disappear so the building can fall for 100 feet at free fall speed. That's impossible. That's a, a violation of, of the fundamental law of physics that says that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. If floors fall, they tend to fall and are braced by the floor directly beneath it. And there's some delay there. Because of redundancy, because of uh, all the other columns in the building that were not affected. Even if a floor were to collapse, it still wouldn't be able to collapse all of the connections simultaneously at the rate that it did without secondary explosions. Even they kind of have happy music. <laughs> <laughs> it's just yeah, it's the the crime of the crime of the century. I mean, other than slavery, destroying the Native Americans, uh, every other illegal well, century, war. Century, millennium. So you know. The century, not millennium, right? At least certainly of the last. Uh, well, since you know, since JFK's assassination. Um, but you know, so here we have <laughs> physics involved in uh, the, the, uh, the real story about free fall and that, you know, the analogy that I tried to make to my family today, which where they were also like, wow, really? You know, third building? Um, the, the analogy, like for instance, the uh, not, even, not building seven, let's take the, one of the twin towers. You have basically like a, and somebody said this on the video, I think the, the guy with the beard at one point, another video, but basically you have a uh, Volkswagen on top of a semi truck. And they're saying that gravity alone, even if you cut all those bars, you know, gravity alone basically crushed that, that Volkswagen crushed the semi truck, you know, with gravity alone. And that's basically what they're asking us to believe in both the Twin Towers. Um, now, in the <laughs> in the Building 7, you know, the uh, uh, some of the testimonies that I've seen about the top penthouse dropping in first like that, that is just blatantly a a, you know, a, uh, what do you call it, a controlled demolition because the, that means the center columns have been blown out and the top of the middle of the structure on the top bullet goes down first and then everything collapses in on in top of itself, which is basically what it did um, at free fall speed. So comments on that, uh, on that video. Well, I just, uh, I wish Brandon was here because it makes me think about, uh, you know. Our two uh, PhDs, they, our two PhDs yeah. didn't bother to show up to look at the evidence today. <laughs> I want to say, um, I don't know if that's a conspiracy theory or not, but uh, <laughs> go ahead, Eric. Sorry. Uh, uh, but I'm trying not to laugh. Sorry. Hold on. <laughs> um, so I've seen, I've seen, um, and I understand uh, physics a little bit as much as some dweeb behind a computer can. Um, and it just doesn't add up to me. No, none of it. None of it adds up to me. Um it doesn't make sense. Um, I've watched, I've actually, you know, um, I'm kind of a sports nut a little bit, obviously got Denver Broncos hat on. Um, and so I've watched like uh, mile high stadium when it got blown up. I watched uh, kingdom when it got blown up and that's what this looked like. That's exactly what this looked like. It, it, it looked very controlled and it looked like it just so happened that a plane also hit it. Um, when you're talking about falling at a free fall speed, well, that's pretty simple. Um, that means that there was nothing standing in the way, um, which there certainly was. This was not an empty shell of a building. This was a building with floors um, that was specifically built to withstand instances such as this. Uh, and at minimum, something doesn't add up. I don't know what it is. Uh, we at least need to investigate. If, if you don't believe that this was done by the government, then you have to at least think about maybe the fact that we let somebody slip by that uh, did uh, perhaps plant bombs. Um, 
I don't know what Dave just put up there, but uh, no, I'm just putting up. This is the website of uh, architects and engineers uh, for 9/11 Truth, and these are the guys that have put together this video. And we're going to be talking to uh, Ted Walter. It's Ted. <laughs> I gotta get better at names. Chella, you got you got Chella says you gotta get better at names, Dave. Uh, I do, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, this was you know all last minute, and he was gracious enough to come on. He's at a um, they're at a uh, conference in New York today. Um, so he's going to join us after the conference, but, um, yeah, I mean, Richard, that's, that's, that's physics, Richard. <laughs> physics. Yeah. Uh, well, so from what I gather was the, the explanation about what actually caused it to collapse took, uh, it took a couple several years before it came to light about what the official explanation even was. That the it was just I don't remember what some of the early rumors were an explanation of what happened when it first collapsed. I, I guess they people said that it was on fire. I don't trying to replay back in my mind. They said that they actually said people were actually saying that they heard bombs going off or they saw explosions. Um, well, yeah, there's the that's the thing. There, you, there's plenty of evidence, video and otherwise, of people hearing explosions, them knowing. They, the fire department, the first responders basically created a cordoned off area where people couldn't go because they knew it was going to come down. Obviously, media reported that it was going to come down. The most telling one that I've seen, and I don't have it up right now, but there's, you know, there's the BBC basically reported that it had, fa it had fallen down half an hour before it fell down. And yep. the building is in her live shot. So, um, you know, they knew it was going to come down. Uh, of course, there's the famous video of Larry Silverstein in the uh, in the documentary, the leaseholder of the property saying, pull it, pull it. We just told the fireman, you know, pull it. So um, uh, and then we watched the building collapse. So it, you know, the fire evidence uh, compared. To, I saw a very interesting image today, actually, in some of the video that I was uh, watching uh, of, a, of a shot of building number five of World Trade Center five. And there are several other buildings in this complex that were damaged beyond, I mean, like really damaged. And the fires raging in building five on every floor, <laughs> still standing, that building. So, um, you know, we, we have evidence of definitely misinformation happening. And so we're hoping to hear from um, the architects and uh, engineers for truth and see where they are in the current investigation they'll be joining us at 6 30 and yeah. um and we're going to find out where they are and where they are with the alaska let me i'm going to play this is the um this is a video of uh let me see if i can find it here uh this is the uh okay this is the evaluation um the university of alaska because of architects and engineers for truth which are at they are at 20 2,628 architects and engineers are part of the organization. Uh, when they put out their first video there, it was wow. at 1,500. It's up to 2,628 uh, with over 21,000 signatures on their petition from their website, which I, uh, here, I'll put it up again so you guys uh, can see it. Uh, here it is. Uh, these are the guys that created it. Um, it's uh, ae911truth.org. And uh, it was uh, created basically by Richard Gage and uh, these other dudes uh, who basically said, no, nah, there's something wrong here. And uh, so 21,000 signatures, and you see their mission is a research compile and disseminate in scientific information about the destruction of all three World Trade Center skyscrapers. So they're looking at everything. And uh, the, uh, Building 7, of course, uh, we are talking about it today. And this is what they've been able to have enough, raise enough money for. They are looking to raise more money to continue their investigation. And they have a store and you can buy DVDs and things like that. So I encourage you to support them if you can. But uh, they did get enough money and are currently funding a two-year study at the University of Alaska. And uh, they, they have their own YouTube channel and website and they have updates and you can go down and you can, and you can look at their evidence, you can download their, um, uh, you know, their documents and what they're doing. And so this is, uh, I think this is it. Yes, this is it. Uh, let me go. This is the a little primo, uh, what do you call it? A preview of uh, what they're doing up in Alaska. I hope this is it. Here we go. <laughs> 
Nope, that's not it. Hang on. Stand by. Grassroots, people. Grassroots. I was going to play the video, but then I got high. Talk amongst yourselves for a second here. Ooh, was going to find that link from earlier. There it but is. Then I got okay. high. Okay, oh then I got uh, All right, here we go. I got link now. Ready? Here we go. My name is Leroy Holsey. I'm a forensic engineer and a professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Steel is a very fire resistant material. When a structure fails, my job is to figure out why. Over the next year, with a team of PhD students, I will be rebuilding World Trade Center Building 7. How does floor 13 respond with respect to 12? Using the same drawings that were used to build it originally, we will reconstruct it virtually. Our goal is to figure out why it collapsed late in the afternoon on September 11, 2001 even though it was not hit by an airplane. The investigation conducted by the National Institute of Standards and Technology concluded, What we found was that uncontrolled building fires caused an extraordinary event. The collapse of World Trade Center 7 was primarily due to fires. Our investigation will evaluate the probability that this was the cause of the collapse. We are making this study open and transparent. Whether you are a physicist, engineer, architect, fire expert, or a specialist in another field, or just an ordinary citizen, we want your participation. We are making all of our data available online. Every aspect of our process regarding the modeling will be shared. And we will be giving regular updates from the lab as we continue our work. Join us and getting to the bottom of why World Trade Center 7 collapsed on September 11th, 2001. Watch the explosions, right there. You see them? Do you see those? Hang on, go back. This is something I saw today that just fucking, oh, sorry, pardon my French. Uh, Actually, ironically, a person my in the chat asked you to speak French. I'm not well, even kidding. I think kidding. that was somebody else, wasn't it? They were asking, were they really asking me to speak French? No, I don't speak French. Well, they said, speak in French, It's like, please. remember, what was a fish called Wanda? <laughs> the fish, fish called Wanda? Speak French. Uh, the only fish I know's name is Nemo. I don't know. Okay, I just want to, I just want to... Uh, uh, that's so we, you know, part of what I'm talking about here is there's some serious science going on that are actually investigating what happened, at least in, uh, with that, with that tower. Um, oh no, that's not what I want. Okay. That's why I just want to show you, I want to get a frame here in this video we just watched and I, a, a piece of, a piece of video here. Is this it? Oh no. Uh, at the end, there's one shot of, of clear shot of world trade center seven that shows what could be um, basically the, dem the video of the demolition. And here, I'm going to bring it back up. Here we go. It's at this end. It's this, it's this video. Now, this is before the, you see, I think that's starting to collapse up here. This is right at the beginning of the collapse. Uh, and I encourage anyone to find this video and actually see what they see, what I see. Now, what I'm looking at is over here. I'm looking over in this area, in the area right underneath the TI. Oh, evaluation in the right side of the building. I don't know if I, I my pointer is not working, but okay. So just, just watch. I'm going to leave the sound off. There. Did you see it? You see this? <laughs> I can't point, but right next to where it says subscribe, there's a nice long line of uh, explosions happening in the window. Here it is. Watch it again. Boom. Ugh. Sorry, I have the I don't know I have you, it going on my other computer. I know so I don't know if, I don't know if you guys can see it, but that's uh that a, some some people are saying that that is there's no fire going on there. 
maybe that's just windows blowing out. I think that's one of the claims. But uh, <laughs> people, ex experts in this field, would say that those are explosions of of uh, charges that are blowing out support. Oh, what? You see what I'm seeing? <laughs> see, I'm watching on YouTube delayed. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So <clears throat> that was another. That was something else that popped up, and I'm like, so these guys are. There's some real scientific research being done because obviously you see that report you see what the nist spokesman says their their basically their story is an ordinary event caused an extraordinary event an ordinary event of office fires of office furniture created an extraordinary event which was the failure of one column that caused a f massive failure of the entire structure area fire just area in one part of the building not even the whole building now each one of those floors is the size of a football field it's not a symmetrical building that's one of the if you watch the videos from the wtc7 evaluation.org uh some of their updates and their initial videos it's not a symmetrical building it's an oblong building if you look about it from overhead and each side is not the same so if it f fell from fire, it should not fall straight down. And even, I mean, you have to try really hard, I would think, to get that to fall straight down. So I'm, we're hoping that that's going to uh, come up with some real truth. Thoughts? Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, watching the, the video again in slow motion, I see the, the top center obviously being the first thing that you see collapse. And then, so the story was, uh, and I, I was just reading a little bit, uh, Popular Mechanics has a, a debunking 9-11 conspiracies thing that I was going through, so I wanted to kind of kind of get into a good, game. Good work, Rich. But, Counting <laughs> on you for that one. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> and so, like, the the fires were supposedly in, like, two separate levels in, near the bottom, of, in the first ten stories or so of the building, uh, and... Now I wasn't sure whether how how uh, expansive they were, uh, and as you mentioned, it, it was just you know office furniture and stuff like that. It doesn't seem to make sense. To I mean, the two problems I have reconciling is is that uh, how the building collapses. If that was intentional, how often are they capable of doing that intentionally? And then if it was unintentional. How, how often is it that that happens unintentionally? And so I, I looked around. Uh, I couldn't find any example of that ever happening to a building at, before it to that in that way. Uh, I don't know. if I'm sure other people have looked. I don't know if anybody else has ever come across anything. But You are correct, sir. Yeah. You are correct, <laughs> sir. I, I saw some other buildings collapsing as a result of some fires, but it, they weren't complete collapses. They weren't nearly as clean. No, there's there's <laughs> actually been there's actually been since 9/11 in Hong Kong, uh, Mandarin the Mandarin burned every floor for hours and hours, 12 hours, something like that, 16 hours, never came down. Not before or since have steel structured buildings collapsed because of fire. Firemen wouldn't go in them if they thought they could collapse from yeah, there, there's a protocol like a non such a non catastrophic fire right like, completely a, non catastrophic fire is is relatively common when it comes to you know tall buildings and offices like i mean they're reasonably rare events but it's not that uncommon for a, a, a fire to get started and to expand across well the, the entire floor well that now the fires uh you talk about the fires some of the evidence that they're presenting uh, in the preliminary that I saw these uh, these 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 uh, examinations, these reevaluations, if you will, um, we're talking about basically they yeah there were there was something on there was something on fire for seven hours, uh, but they found that basically nothing was on fire in any particular area for longer than twenty minutes. So as fires do uh, normal fires as this was it finds new fuel and moves along and then the fuel is done and it and it and it goes out there was no jet fuel in in uh in building seven um you know there were literally this is part of the evidence of explosion in world trade center seven or rather one and two is that the ejection of beams from the side of the building into other buildings um you know there was massive damage to many buildings around, a, a building seven was blocked 
by one of the buildings. If you look at the, the footprint, Building 7 was kind of blocked, part of it, uh, ironically, where the fire, where they say the fire was on the 8th, you know, between the 10th floor, you said, under the 10th floor, where the explosion is supposed to have happened on the 8th floor. <laughs> yeah, so that's, you know, we're, we're, you're adding up the, 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 the dots, as it were. But, uh, you know, the, the, there's the, uh, James, unfortunately, obviously hasn't been able to join us from Japan. We're going to get him on the show again another time. If he jumps in later, I'm going to go right to him. But um, his new series on the suspects of 9-11 um, are, you know, people will sometimes just write this stuff, write him off as a anarchist conspiracy theorist. Uh, but, um, he got, he has some pretty good sources and does really good investigation, uh, on many levels. So, um, and this particular one is about Rudy Giuliani and I encourage you to go watch all of them, but this one is about Rudy Giuliani and it talks about building seven and some of the evidence, uh, and witness eyewitness evidence to what you're talking about. And uh, I think just watching this, it's a little bit of a long one. Uh, and he's put out the whole video today of all of the, uh, all of the suspects in one report, uh, but you can watch them all individually and they're all very fascinating. A couple of which I had, I knew about and were in my sort of radar as to who's behind this, but a couple I didn't know about. So very interesting videos that a lot of stuff has come out over the last few years, guys. It's amazing the amount of information since I've been out of this loop uh, looking into this. And one of the interesting things that I wanted to talk to James about, and maybe another time is the Paul Bremer connection to yes. the investment firm. That was a direct hit. Uh, that really got me got that really burned my ass when I found out about that. And I didn't really know about it because I had basically stopped looking like you, Eric. So let me play this nine 11 suspects. This is part of his series, James Corbett, the Corbett report. Um, I've been talking, so let me just bring it up. I think I've got it. Yes, I do. Here we go. You're listening to The Corbett Report. After stepping down as mayor of New York City, Rudy Giuliani tried to launch himself as a national political leader on the back of the single defining event of his career. September 11th. September 11th. Terrorists or terrorism. September 11th. The flames of hell emanating from those buildings. September 11, fallen towers of the World Trade Center. Terrorists. September 11, 2001. In the end, he failed miserably, with voters immediately seeing his ploy for what it was. Base political pandering. 9-11 was bad. I agree with that. God, I can't believe how easy this is. But what many do not realize is that Giuliani's case is not just that of another ghoulish politician parading on the corpses of those who died on his watch for his own political gain. On the day of 9-11, while the remains of the Twin Towers and World Trade Center 7 were still smoldering, one of Mayor Giuliani's first concerns was clearing away the evidence from the crime scene. We were able to move 120 dump trucks out of the city last night, which will give you a sense of the work that was done overnight. It's wild out here. They just keep coming. Look. It doesn't stop. There's more. I think keep thinking it's at the end, and it's not. Despite reassurances that the rapid removal of the evidence from Ground Zero was important for emergency access, this process went far beyond merely clearing a path for rescue workers. As Eric Lawyer, founder of Firefighters for 9-11 Truth, points out, the massive operation to haul away over 1.5 million tons of debris and to sell much of the steel to Chinese firm Bao Steel at discount prices was not just an overzealous approach to clearing the area, but was itself a crime. 9-11 was the greatest loss of life and property damage in U.S. fire history. This should have been the most protected, preserved, over-tested, and thorough investigation of a crime scene in world history. Sadly, it was not. What was it? Well, we know from their own admission 
the majority of the evidence was destroyed. I, like Richard said, 22 years of experience, I've seen a lot of crime scenes, I've never seen anything like this in my life. <clears throat> I, was, I was out of the site, I saw trucks leaving faster than you know, anywhere I've ever seen, but I accepted it at the time, and for years I accepted it, because it was a recovery and rescue operation, and that's normal to have something like that going. Again, we never seen anything like it, but that was expected. What I didn't know for years, what was going on behind the scenes, was that evidence was being destroyed when it was shipped off. Um, by their own admission, um, Tower 7 investigation, this investigation at Tower 7 had no physical evidence. How do you investigate a crime when you've destroyed all the evidence? It doesn't make sense. Um, they also admit that they refused to test the explosives or to test for explosives or, or residue of thermite. Now, this is what I'm going to go into here just real quickly, is there are national standards for an investigation. That's what all of us are asking for, an investigation that follows national standards and holds people accountable. Needless to say, an investigation of the 9-11 crime scene following the national investigation standards has never been conducted, and never will be, as Giuliani oversaw the illegal destruction of the evidence itself. To add insult to this injury, in 2003, New York City medical examiner Charles Hirsch revealed that in the mad scramble to get rid of the crime scene evidence, human remains from the World Trade Center had been left at the Fresh Kills landfill where the debris was sorted and the steel was sold. In 2007, Eric Beck, a senior supervisor of the recycling facility that sifted the debris, admitted that some of those human remains ended up in a mixture that was used to pave roads and fill potholes in New York City. But as grotesque as such revelations are, they are not the most shocking part of Giuliani's 9-11 story. In the late 1990s, the mayor oversaw the creation of a state-of-the-art $13 million emergency command center to coordinate the city's disaster recovery and response efforts. Located on the 23rd floor of World Trade Center Building 7, just across Vesey Street from the Twin Towers, the center, dubbed by local press at the time as Giuliani's Bunker, included reinforced, bulletproof, and bomb-resistant walls, its own air supply and water tank, beds, showers to accommodate 30 people, and three backup generators. It could be used to monitor all of New York's emergency communications frequencies and was staffed 24 hours a day. And yet, remarkably, on the morning of 9-11, neither Mayor Giuliani nor any other city personnel or police or fire department officials were in the bunker after the Twin Tower strikes. As I told you guys before, it's very, it's very uh, funny. I was on my way to work and uh, traffic was excellent. I received a call that uh, a small Cessna had hit the uh, World Trade Center. And I was asked to go and uh, man the uh, Office of Emergency Management. Upon arriving into the OEM uh, EOC, we noticed that everybody was gone. I saw coffee that was on a desk. Still, the smoke was still coming off the coffee. I saw, I saw uh, half-eaten sandwiches. So why wasn't the mayor and the city's emergency personnel in the location that had been purpose-built for just such an event? According to Giuliani, they had been told to evacuate because they had been given a warning that the Twin Towers were going to collapse. A warning that was evidently not passed on to any of the emergency personnel that were still working in the buildings. I went down to the scene and we set up uh, headquarters at 75 Barclay Street, which was right there with the police commissioner, the fire commissioner, mm -hmm. the head of emergency management. And we were operating out of there when we were told that the World Trade Center was going to collapse. And it did collapse before we could actually get out of the building. So we were trapped in the building for 10, 15 minutes and finally found an exit got out, walked north, and took a lot of people with us. Giuliani, in his own words, has admitted that he was warned that the World Trade Center was going to collapse. This despite the fact that there was no possible way for this to be predicted in the first hour of the unfolding disaster. Even more incredibly, despite being given this warning, no effort was made to pass it on to the police, firefighters, and other responders who were still working in and around the buildings. When precisely was this warning given, and by whom? Why, despite acting on this warning himself, did Giuliani make no effort to pass the warning on to others? Predictably, 
When confronted with these questions by activists during his 2008 presidential campaign, Giuliani merely smiled and denied that he had ever received such a warning. You reported to Peter Jennings that on 9-11 that the World Trade, the houses were going to collapse and, <clears throat> excuse me, no steel structure in, the, in, in history has ever collapsed due to a fire. How come the people in the buildings weren't notified? And who, who else knew right. about this? And, yeah. and how do you sleep at night? Ma'am, I didn't know that the towers were going to collapse. So you reported it to Peter Jennings. Jennings. No, no. no. You said and, after no. Peter Jennings on ABC and video, also, you indeed said that the towers, uh, you were notified the towers were going to collapse while you were in some, um, not, sh not sure exactly where you were prior to, but you said on ABC video with Peter Jennings in an interview, um, that you were aware that the towers were going to collapse in advance. We'd like to know who told you the towers were going to collapse in advance, sir. And also we'd like to know who else you told. Well, the fact is that uh, I didn't realize the towers would collapse. I never realized that. So where was the mayor on 9-11? On Pier 92, which was already set up as a functional command center due to a full-scale emergency drill by FEMA that, by a remarkable coincidence, had been scheduled for the following day. And we selected Pier 92 as our command center. And the reason Pier 92 was selected as the command center was because on the next day, on September 12th, Pier 92 was going to have a drill. It had hundreds of people here, from FEMA, from the federal government, from the state, from the state emergency management office, and they were getting ready for a drill for biochemical attack. So that was going to be the place they were going to have the drill. The equipment was already there. So we were able to establish a command center there within three days that was two and a half to three times bigger than the command center that we had lost at Seven World Trade Center. And it was from there that the rest of the search and rescue effort was, um, was completed. Mayor Giuliani oversaw the illegal destruction of the 9-11 crime scene and is criminally liable for the deaths of hundreds of emergency workers for not passing on prior warnings about the collapses of the Twin Towers. It is no wonder, then, that the Fire Department of New York so passionately detests Giuliani for his actions in disgracing their fallen brothers and covering up the 9-11 crime. Rudy Giuliani has used the horrible events of September 11, 2001, to create a carefully crafted persona. But the fact is, what Rudy portrays is not a full picture of the decisions made that led, in our view, to the unnecessary deaths of our FDNY members and the attempt to stop the dignified recovery of those lost. The urban legend of America's mayor needs to be balanced by the truth. So what is the reward for Giuliani's criminal actions on 9-11? An offer to become the head of the Department of Homeland Security in the event of a Trump presidency, of course. This is the state of American politics, and this is precisely why a true investigation of what happened on 9-11 never has, and never will, be conducted by the U.S. government itself. I can tell you that there was no credible intelligence. I know the guy that went into his broker in San Diego and, and said, cash me out, it's going down tomorrow. That's a little disturbing. That from uh, <laughs> the Corbett Report. Uh, the website is up there. Uh, CorbettReport.com, I think it is. Uh, yes, CorbettReport.com. Two T's. And uh, that's just one of about uh, five. Uh, looks at alternative, you know, we, uh, they, it's not even, okay, the crime. <laughs> let's, let's put aside for a second the... Uh, uh, I'm going to get my camera up here. Sorry, guys. Let's put aside for a second the, uh, the idea that <clears throat> there was uh, pre-knowledge of the event itself. Let's, uh, let's talk about the fact that he admitted on national TV that he was told that the building was going to come down and that, uh, that they evacuated that Building 7 because of that. So as James says, that's, uh, you know, he didn't warn the firefighters. He didn't warn anybody. Uh, if he knew that they were, yeah. if he indeed knew that they were coming down, which he admitted to uh, on live TV. So, you know, a lot of this stuff has disappeared. A lot of these reports on CNN and Fox have disappeared from archives. 
uh, the only reason, you know, I was telling my, my cousin today, he's like, how do you know all this stuff? It's like, look, you know, you can bet uh, James backs up a lot of most, all of everything. James backs up everything with documents and mainstream news sources and uh, some of the only remaining. Unfortunately, some of the only remaining parts of those are on, uh, you know, Prison Planet website, but they're from AP sources that are gone now, you know. So which I think we, Eric and I were talking about this the other day. I firmly believe that Alex Jones is a CIA plant. And yes. that and that he is he's actually CIA and you know because disinformation is ninety five percent true, and you know and he's basically tells everybody what's going on. Loose change is like here's what happened, <laughs> and then he says it was because of lizard people from another planet, and that's where he loses everybody. So and that's what the CIA going now. Oh, we'll get him. Lost me. We'll get him. Why I stopped there you being go. a truther. That yeah, and you know attacking the, TYT same thing with right. Hill. What's that? Hillary's uh, help. Same thing with Hillary's help. You know, it's like, you know, people were like, you know, she needs help getting up places. She doesn't seem to be able to stand. She's always got a stool. You so know, so why like, did she do that before yeah. she got in her damn van? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. This that doesn't like, help. I, have you read any tweets from the Donald? I haven't. I don't know. I'm sure he's tweeting the hell out of that. Uh, but listen, that, you know, the end of that video is very plain. Guess who's going to be his Homeland Security guy? That's pretty damn scary. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty damn scary. The guy that knows what the fuck happened. He yeah. knows what the fuck happened. You know, and I mean, and every, you know, L. Paul Bremer, you know, I wanted to talk to James about that. And maybe we can talk about that on another show if I can get him on. But, you know, if you know who this guy, if you, you know who this guy is, he's the guy that ran Iraq into the ground, basically, and created I ISIS in Iraq or, you know, or, or fomented them or whatever you want to call it because he fired the army and blah, 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 but basically destroyed Iraq. And then you find out later that just so happens it's his investment company that was ground, that was the, the direct hit, was the target. And there was whistleblowers in that damn office. And guess who were at a meeting that morning? The whistleblowers, among others. And he was conveniently not at a meeting at the meeting. And there were other people in that target zone that were on conference calls, didn't make Larry Silverstein, didn't make his morning meeting. I mean, all of this stuff is documented in the news and for in past, you know, in documentaries that have been put together, you know. And the only reason we know about this stuff is uh, people are digging and looking and they're finding, you know, the Wayback Machine and they're looking at archives. And, you know, and, you know, it's true. People on the Internet have a lot of time on their hands and people are putting a lot of work in to finding out information. I mean, some of the research on the Pentagon is just, it's, it's remarkable what they're, what they found, you know, it's what some of this research is finding at the, and a lot of it is circumstantial. A lot of it is, you know, you could, you could, well, I can explain that away, but a lot of it really isn't. And, um, it, you know, we need real investigations about the whole damn thing and we're not getting it. So, um, that you know that that you know basically so there you go Richard here there this is a basically an indestructible structure, <laughs> and and it was brought down by office fires, um, perfectly it, symmetrically. It's almost like if if Richard was able to take down Brandon, it's that impossible. <laughs> it's that impossible. It's okay, that okay. Brandon <laughs> is that Brandon is going to fall to the ground by gravity alone after one punch. <laughs> Because his head right. is not as heavy right. as the bottom of his body. It's just not going to work. <laughs> In any case. So, we jest. By the um, way, when, when I know we're digressing far too much, or at least I am, but... Oh, you got to break it up a little bit. When we're, when we're talking about Hillary, I just picture her going, just got to get to the van. Just got to get to the van. Just got to get to the, get the van. Get, get to the van. Get to the van. He got the arm. I was, carrying, I was carrying my mother-in-law to the car, just like that, before we went on the air, guys. That's why I said, hey, hang on a second. And I, my, we, my wife brings over her mom, you know, a couple few days a week <laughs> uh, in her wheelchair, and we got to get her into the car. So uh, I was right before going on air. So, yeah, man, I was. I know that. I know that hold under the arm move. Been there. Yeah. Done that. And Chell's like, oh, she's fainting. I'm like, yeah, yeah. she's fainting. All right. And, you know, the cough, I mean, oh, it just plays right into it. Man, I don't know. God, it's... Oh, uh, yeah, and it's, it's pneumonia. And, and, like, well, and then people are like, well, then why were you posing with the child? That, that's Oh, well, you know, she's on antibiotics, so, like, she's not contagious. It's like, well, you just found it two days ago. 
Yeah, I've never diagnosed it anyway. I've had no, <laughs> I've had no, months. I've had pneumonia. It ain't fun. And if she's got no, th- and if she's got thrombosis and you know no, a no pneumonia and old people are not a good combination. No, and I don't want to. And I just because I know that. I mean, I see you know like my mother in laws in a in a locked facility with eighty five people and with dementia, and you know pneumonia is not a happy thing. They're like, you, you sure you don't want a flu a shot? You sure you don't want a shot for pneumonia, for the flu? No flu shot. How about pneumonia? Okay, pneumonia will take. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's it's a scary thing. Anyway, we digress again. But there, here's the thing. Here's Giuliani's going to be his, uh, you know, uh, Homeland Security czar, which is just, a, just <laughs> you know, you watch that video and you go, really? Uh, so we're going to, we're waiting for, um, we're waiting just for, like, the, for oh, Ted to join like us. A, just like uh, just Giuliani you. said uh, that uh, Obama is, is the only person that's allowed terrorist attacks to happen. Yeah. He said that too. Don't forget that. Yeah. All right. Let me get this set up here, guys. Uh, do our guest looks like our guest is arriving. <clears throat> We're going to bring him in. Ted is here. Ted Walter from Architects and Engineers. Uh, he's trying, looks like he's trying. Oh, no. Is he trying? Is that? Yeah, that's Ted. He's trying to sign in. Yeah. I don't have his camera yet. Do you see his camera? Not, oh, there he yep. is. Yep, there. Oh, I can't. I'm having some trouble with Facebook. I can't, won't let me see people. All right, let me uh, or not Facebook. Uh, Firefox. Hi, Ted. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, I think he's muted. Is he? He's muted? on mute. Yeah. Sorry. Hi. Yeah. Oh, hey. There you are. Hey there. Let How me just let me just adjust here, Ted. Uh, I'm gonna. I gotta. I gotta quickly uh, set you up. I'm gonna bring your camera up here. A uh, little more headroom there, Ted. Can you give me a little more headroom? That'd be awesome. Tilt up. That's perfect. Looking good, my friend. Hey, uh, sir, I, I thank you for joining us uh, at the very last minute. Uh, welcome to Project Sanity. Uh, I'm with my cohorts here on this show. My name is Dave. I'm with Eric Miller uh, and Richard Green. We're uh, contributors and, uh, and uh, hosts of uh, this grassroots uh, citizen journalist uh, or, you know, network on the YouTube, and I really appreciate you uh, coming on tonight. We've uh, it took a little convincing to get these guys to do this show, uh, not too much, but uh, we definitely, I definitely was able to. Uh, I'm going to try to bring you up here and maybe get Richard up because I can see Richard on my Facebook. So here we go. We're bringing everybody in. Uh, yeah, I still can't get that Facebook working. All right, I'll I'll bring you in, uh, Richard. I'll get you in here, uh, Mr. Walter. Welcome. Uh, you are a spokesperson for uh, architects and engineers um, for 911 Truth. Um, yes. And I've just been literally I have to. I, I must apologize. I literally have just been watching your videos within the last couple of weeks because I dropped the ball on this movement. And uh, a couple of things got me back into it. And one of which, of course, the smoking gun for me has always been Building 7. And the fact that there's a new, uh, new investigation happening uh, really sparked my interest. And I, I'd like you to talk about that. And, and where were you today? And uh, just uh, tell us about what's going on and where we are with that investigation with the University of Alaska. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys very much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, as you said, I, uh, I, I work for Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. It's a, a pretty small nonprofit organization, uh, but we represent over 2,600 architects and engineers uh, who have all signed our petition, uh, which calls upon uh, the U.S. Congress to open a new investigation uh, into the destruction of uh, the World Trade Center Twin Towers, as well as Building 7, uh, which is a 47-story building in the World Trade Center complex that collapsed later in the day uh, on 9-11. Um, so I, uh, today I was uh, at a conference that we are uh, co-sponsoring along with other groups and organizations. It was at Cooper Union uh, in, in, in the village in New York City. Um, it was it was a really uh, it was a very productive conference, um, and I, I can tell you a little bit more about that um, a little bit later. Um, and uh, the study that, that you're speaking to is uh, we call it World Trade Center Seven Evaluation WTC Seven Evaluation. Um, the website is WTC Seven Evaluation org. And it's, it's basically a study that's being conducted by uh, a professor uh, at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. His name is Dr. Leroy Halsey. Uh, he's the chair of the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department um, at the university. 
And uh, we connected with him about a year and a half ago um, to, to undertake a, basically a, you know, a computer simulation, a finite element uh, modeling analysis of building seven to you know, try to really, um, in a way, decisively, definitively answer the question of whether fires uh, could have brought down this 47-story steel frame structure. And um, there was a, a, a colleague of ours, a friend in Alaska, who had you know, been reaching out to a lot of people, actually, to see, see who might be interested in performing this kind of study, um, who obviously somebody who has the expertise and the resources to do it. And he found Dr. Halsey, and, and Dr. Halsey was interested. Um, he's, you know, pretty late in his career. Uh, I think we all know that 9-11 and, you know, asking questions about what really happened in 9-11 is a, it's a controversial subject. Um, but Dr. Halsey felt like he was in a position where he had, he had nothing to lose. Um, and he was really interested to take this on. Um, and, and really the goal, the idea is that you can basically take the drawings from the building that were used to build the building and recreate it digitally. And if you do it right, you can simulate the behavior of the building and how the building would respond to various inputs. Um, in, in this case, we're primarily focused on fire. Is there any way that fire could cause the steel members of this building to react and move in such a way that, um, that a structural failure would occur that would, that would then bring down the entire building? Uh, and that's the story that we've been given by uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, which is an agency of the, the Department of Commerce, uh, which started its investigation into the collapse of all three buildings uh, in 2002. And they finished their investigation to the towers in 2005. And then finally in 2008, six years later, they came out with their report on Building 7. And essentially they allege uh, what in the view of many engineers and architects that, that we represent is a fantastical, uh, implausible scenario uh, of how fires could have, uh, you know, caused this structure to to suddenly come down into its footprint, um, and the goal of this study, really, you know, a lot of people will ask the question, you know, why why are you doing this study if you if there's already all this evidence that Building Seven was brought down by a controlled demolition? It looks obviously like a controlled demolition, um, and uh, and I can speak more to that. All the the features of Building Seven's collapse, if if your your viewers are not familiar with it, but um, the answer is, you know, we more more science and more research is always good. And right now, the only computer modeling that's been done of Building Seven is by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, as well as a few um, engineering firms that work for uh, different parties in litigation related to Larry Silverstein and, and Con Edison and. But the only public, publicly available uh, modeling or story about what happened to Building 7 based on modeling uh, is from NIST. And somebody else needs to do it and, and see if NIST uh, do their own modeling and see if NIST did it right, if NIST's um, model makes sense. And, uh, and, and really, this is how we gain a, a greater foothold within the um, engineering community, the academic engineering community and, and engineering, engineering community at large, is by doing this type of study. Uh, without this, uh, no matter how strong the evidence is, no, many, no matter how many architects and engineers we have, um, we're just not going to gain a whole lot of traction without a study like this being performed by, you know, a professor, uh, you know, like one at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, and so, so that's what we've done. And it, it's been quite an investment uh, financially on the part of our organization. Um, but we've chosen to sponsor this, this research by Dr. Halsey. And he, uh, he actually announced today, at, uh, well, yesterday at this conference, he traveled to New York to uh, present his preliminary findings and um, based on about a year of, of, of analysis that they've been doing. And, uh, you know, his conclusion, um, pretty simply, uh, but definitively, he can say at this point that fire could not have and did not bring down this building. So that's, that's where we're at. Um, there's a lot more work that has to be done to shore up that finding and and as well he his focus his approach is to go well let's look at everything else that could possibly have somehow affected this building you know somehow the debris falling on on the ground and falling on the building weakening it weakening it in some way um, but so the next this study should be done by next April um, at, at which point, you know, we'll have a final report from him and then he will go about trying to publish his findings uh, in academic journals. And we are, you know, really counting on, on this 
to to make a difference and, and help this uh, this you know this argument gain traction within the engineering community. And a lot of our time by next year will be devoted to making sure, doing everything that we can to ensure that it does. So you, you, you mentioned that he basically, uh, Dr. Holsey has made the conclusion that this, you know, this did not come down by fire. Um, mm -hmm. And now he's basically, the rest of the, uh, the study is going to be to try to find out what did bring down the building. Is that right? Yeah. So he's, Holsey came into this, uh, into this project saying, I will definitely be able to tell you what did not bring down this building. Um, and that's, so the goal has been to primarily look at whether fire could have somehow brought down this building. Um, I think once he has exhausted all sort of natural scenarios uh, and, you know, subjected the building to those natural scenarios in the computer model, um, I think that there's, that leaves us with only with only one uh, rather obvious explanation. Uh, I'll be honest, it remains to be seen how explicitly Dr. Halsey wants to address that. Um, you know, but we, we, the idea is to eliminate, at a minimum, to eliminate all natural scenarios. I mic myself. This is where we are on building seven, which this is, in, I mean, encouraging as far as what, you know, the truth movement, if you will, uh, looking for some real, real evidence as opposed to the, the NIST report and the, the complete ignoring of it in the 911 commission. We've been, uh, we've been watching some of the videos, uh, uh, from Dr. Halsey, the, uh, when the, for when it first started, I've been looking at some of their reports, uh, and we've been looking and we've been talking about building seven, uh, pretty much the first part of the show and, and the anomalies. Uh, so it's good news that, uh, there is actually an investigating you know, investigation progressing. What about, I know you're looking into both towers. Where are you with uh, the twin towers? And because the more and more I look at it, you know, we got to be looking at that too. So are, are you any further in maybe, I guess it really is going to come down to raising some money to, to funding a, 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 you know, a report of that size. Yeah. Um, it, money is certainly a factor. I think we wanted, it's definitely on our, on our, um, on the horizon to also model the towers. Um, it's, it's not something that we definitely decided to do or committed to, um, but it's something that ideally we would like to do. Um, we kind of wanted to take one step at a time and see how it goes with building seven uh, and, you know, see how, see how, you know, see what kind of work Dr. Halsey would, would be able to do. Um, but I, I think he is interested in going forward with modeling the towers as well. Um, now we may see that like building seven, his analysis of building seven. And I mean, what, what he also spoke about at the conference was how, how utterly and, and thoroughly, uh, I guess you would say inept in this modeling was and really not only, I mean, a lot of people will take the, you know, the approach that NIST's uh, report and their analysis was, was fraudulent. It was deliberately trying to cover up what happened and come to a different conclusion that was totally unsupported by, by any evidence. Um, but even from just a basic like modeling methodology perspective, they did many things that were were terribly wrong that that Dr. Halsey reported on, and we, th we think that with that kind of a like really damning assessment coming out um, of this study, that 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 alone could be a big trigger for uh, engineers in general and hopefully the, the broader public to really look at this again seriously and then make a rather logical. Uh, jump to saying, okay, well, if Building 7 was a controlled demolition, uh, what does that mean about the Twin Towers? Now, we, there, there is already so much uh, incredibly uh, strong evidence in, in the public sphere uh, regarding the collapse of the Twin Towers. Um, you really just start by looking at the videos of the towers coming down with fresh eyes, and you will realize um, that it is not a building collapsing, it is a building that is explosively disintegrating. The, the behavior of the building is like an umbrella of pulverized, everything in the build, building being instantaneously pulverized and ejected, uh, and the steel completely set, um, shattered, the frame completely shattered, and ejected hundreds of feet in all directions. Um, you don't see the tops of the buildings actually coming down and, and, and hitting each successive floor, the tops of the buildings disappear within a couple seconds. Um, they themselves are totally obliterated before the destruction really commences throughout the rest of the building, uh, at least mostly. So, um, 
and there's so much other evidence as well and you know your viewers may be familiar or not familiar with it um i don't know i probably don't have the time to go into all of it now oh you got, but, you, um, got all, you got all the time you want all right well <laughs> um yeah, yeah so i mean there's uh one of the most powerful presentations that was given today was by uh professor graham mcqueen uh from uh He's a retired professor from McMaster University in, in Ontario, Canada, and he's he's been like the foremost researcher into like looking at and analyzing the, objectively the eyewitness accounts, uh, primarily contained in the FDNY oral histories. In the first year after 9-11, the fire department conducted all these interviews with 503 firefighters uh, and you know paramedics and EMTs, and out of those 503, uh, Dr. McQueen identified 118 of them, 118 of those eyewitness accounts uh, of those oral histories contained uh, eyewitness accounts of explosions occurring in the towers. And he, he laid out some pretty like objective criteria for establishing what he considered to be an explosion witness, um, such that they use the words like, I thought bombs were going off, um, or using the word explosion, using the word blasted out. Um, and and other other similar well, you know, and this stuff, they, these weren't even addressed in the nine eleven commission at all. They they never mentioned the word an explosion except I think once I heard in another context. So yes. none of these people have ever been heard. Yes, um, that's correct. Uh, the nine eleven Graham, uh, you know, Professor McQueen actually said, okay, what did the nine eleven commission tell us about these uh, explosions or any of these eyewitness accounts of explosions? And there's like one half sentence, and it's like very. It was trying to attribute the explosion or the, the perception of explosion to something that something else, something like else. something like yeah. the, the floor is hitting or, or what have you. Um, yeah, so ignored by the nine eleven commission and ignored by the agency that that was tasked with investigating the collapses by NIST. Um, they uh, there was a, a request for correction uh, filed uh, to their final report uh, in two thousand seven by. Uh, an architect, uh, some engineers, and a couple of Island family members uh, addressing all these failures in this investigation. Um, and one of them was their failure to look at any or acknowledge any of the eyewitness accounts of explosions. This came back and said, like, overall, on the balance of things, the eye, all the eyewitness uh, testimony that we read did not lead to the, you know, suggest the idea that these towers were brought down by demolition. Um, if you go and read them, um, and we have this actually trying to think where the most accessible place would be, but we just put out a document that just has the 118 excerpts from the 118 oral histories, like all just together in one, in one place. Um, because we actually, you know, among the things that we do besides like publishing papers and doing research and da da da, you know, as we do some of the more like sensational, like in your face type of stuff too. Um, Cause we basically have to use every avenue um, at our disposal to, to, to raise awareness. Um, so we have a billboard up, outside the New York Times, um, which has a, a very like, you know, graphic picture of the tower, the South Tower coming down, and it says collapse or explosion. Um, and and uh, it, it references the, the eyewitness accounts, which because the New York Times actually sued the city of New York to obtain these oral histories, um, and the oral histories, they finally they won that suit, and the oral histories were released in 2005. And, um, and these oral histories are sitting on on the website of the New York Times, and and yet you know the New York Times has never really delved into what is the evidence contained in these in these oral histories, uh, and that was even said by by David Sanger, the chief correspondent of the Washington chief correspondent of the New York Times, that you know when some somebody called him on C-SPAN and asked him about Building Seven, and he said we we haven't seen any evidence so far to suggest that anything other than the planes brought down these buildings, uh, but the evidence is sitting on their website. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty amazing when you go back over. Um, I mean, even watching today, watching the replay, you know, as they do every year on MSNBC or wherever, you know, what they saw. I mean, every everything that that folks are talking about that has become, you know, that is evidence of what happened is in there. You know, you hear them, uh, you know, saying exactly like, well, you know, talking about the building falling down or or, you know, it's it, it's just there, it's all right there. I'm trying to think of the exact example that I that I saw today, but. Uh, when you go back, as, as so many people have done, 
Uh, and whether it's, you know, you label them conspiracy theorists, um, which is a convenient term created by the CIA anyway, um, and, and a truther, this whole de we demonstrative use, uh, use of the word truther, what well, we're crazy because we want the truth, you know, and so they bundle everybody in there. But just looking at the prima facie evidence, one of the things we're talking about today, and uh, that there's just, we're not getting the whole story. The physics of all the buildings are just wrong, wrong, wrong from every angle and from every conceptual. If you're a professional like you guys are, when you look at that, you, you know, one of the best examples or metaphors that I heard was you can't crush a semi with a Volkswagen with just yeah. gravity. It's not going to happen. I don't care how if you severed the whole thing. It's, you know, it's going to fall over. It's going to fall off. It's not going to crush the whole thing at, at near free fall speed all the way down. The ejections, you know, those beams ended up in buildings. I saw a picture today of, bu of building five fully engulfed, floor to top, fully engulfed the entire building. Never came down. But a half a dozen office, you know, fires on the eighth or tenth floor and one beam uh, complete, uh, creates a, com a completely uh, symmetrical attack. And then we have Barry Jennings' testimony that he said exactly yes. what was going on. And that uh, Giuliani, you know, we know he said get out of the building to people and he barely missed it, obviously, but he knew towers were coming down. He admitted to it. Eric, I know you're dying to get in here. Do you have a question, sir? Eric Miller, uh, Ted, one of my cohorts yeah. here and a longtime uh, a follower of these, of these investigations. Go ahead, friend. So, so actually, my question is, I mean, it's, it's obviously on topic, but uh, something that's always made me curious with the organizations like the one you work with is if you receive any kind of government pushback or pushback from uh, even corporations uh, that may not want you to be uh, furthering these investigations. Um, and because obviously there's there's answers that you're gonna come up with that, that they're not gonna like. Uh, just pushback in general. Uh, I'm curious about what kind of pushback you've received, if any. Sure. Well, you know, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, there's, Push back from all sorts of different angles. Um, there, there's the, the debunker community, which I really don't know who these people are that, that sit on the internet. It's got to be ultimately a pretty small group of people that's like sitting there and trying to debunk everything we say. But that's that. Who knows who those people are? Um, you, by and large, the attitude of like NIST is to ignore us, right? They put out some FAQs on their website like years ago, and they've sat up there. Um, basically addressing all the evidence that they fail to address in their reports, um, but not conducting any sort of serious analysis, just coming up with like really uh, basic um, and pretty ludicrous explanations to explain away a lot of this evidence. Um, you get, uh, you know, we, we do a lot of outreach, direct outreach to like architects and engineers particularly. I mean, obviously our videos are, are, are widely watched, you know, millions of views of our, of our videos, and that's been a major source of education uh, throughout the world. Um, but we also focus a lot in particular on, you know, educating more architects and engineers, trying to erode uh, support for the official story within the engineering and the architecture community. Um, and we get, you know, we, yeah, we, it's, it's not easy. You know, we go to the, the, the national, uh, you know, the national convention of the American Institute of Architects and, you know, we get a lot of people that are very unhappy about us being there. Uh, we started submitting resolutions asking their members to vote to call upon the Institute to officially support a new investigation into the collapse of Building 7. And we've done that two years now, and we've made some progress. We got 4% of the vote last year, um, which is kind of like mind-boggling. Uh, you know, I mean, because I think, I think you have to realize that at that point where we are, we're with educating members of the AIA, you know, maybe a third of the people in that room, maybe half, uh, actually do think or suspect that Building 7 was a controlled demolition. But getting those folks to vote in favor of it, that's a different matter. Um, yet it's a battle that we have, have chosen, we've picked that battle um, because it's such a, a good vehicle for educating the architecture community. Um, but they try, to, they try to tear us to shreds in the, in the business meeting where, where this resolution is voted on. Um, and so we went back this last year, did it again, had a longer resolution that actually contained all the evidence in it. And, um, we got 11% of the vote, um, which is, you know, basically a, th a three, threefold increase, um, which we felt like was a, a real increase, a serious change in what, you know, some of the members were thinking and feeling about this and the, the, the stance of the, of the AIA of their board, 
changed significantly. Their, their willingness to proudly endorse the official story uh, just diminished. Their official position on our resolution was very, very weak and tepid in terms of what they were willing to say. They said, you know, that this has been, they've, they've come to reasonable conclusions or that this has been investigated by competent authorities and with a reasonable conclusion. But um, whereas last year they were really strongly endorsing it. So um, we get pushback from institutes, institutions like the AIA, the American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, we tried to do a mailing to 35,000 members of the American Society of Civil Engineers this September and they denied us use of their mailing list. We worked with a third party company. Uh, we wanted to put out you know, some really important research that has been done to the, all the members of the, or, well, the most relevant groups of members of the ASCE and they denied use of, our, of their list. Not really that surprising. Um, that's fine, we went and got a different list from you know, using the same third party vendor. We did our mailing to 35,000 civil and structural engineers throughout the country. Um, and that went out within the last week. So we'll see what kind of response there is for that. Um, and then, you know, as far as our internally, th th those are just the, the people that, you know, the powers that be within these, uh, these communities, you know, whoever was behind 9-11 obviously does not want us to succeed. And, you know, we face little impediments here and there that, that look, um, that looks suspicious. Um, you know, our, our website <laughs> gets hacked a fair amount, you know, people try, but, uh, you know, we may, we, we, we deal with it quickly and, and we move on. So what's your, uh, evaluation on, uh, the United States withholding the, uh, what is it? 28, 29 pages of the nine 11 report that included Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, a lot of talk about Saudi Arabia and other information. Um, how, from, from your viewpoint and what you're working on, does that affect any of that or, or just what are your thoughts in general? Sure. So as an organization, we really we don't take a position on like the 28 pages or, you know, um, whether, whether it's a good idea to, it was a good idea to advocate for the release of the 28 pages. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a topic that is the 9-11 truth community, uh, you know, it, it divides opinion to some extent. Um, because some, some people believe, and I'm not speaking for architects and engineers for the truth when I say this, but some, some people suspect that this is some, you know, a limited hangout, uh, that it, you know, and that there's even, you know, uh, an, an, some kind of an operation at foot to be able to blame Saudi Arabia solely for 9-11, you know, and if the only result of the 28 pages coming out and then the passage of, of JASTA last week, and now it's to President Obama uh, to either you know sign or, or veto the JAFTA legislation, which allows family members of 9/11 victims to sue uh, or right, family. I wanted you. I wanted you to explain that a little bit. What exactly? What is JASTA, and uh, yeah. why is Obama even thinking about not signing it? Or is that the case? Yeah. So, so JASTA, as far as I understand it, and it's not something I've spent a huge amount of time looking at, but is basically legislation that will allow. Uh, the families of victims of terrorism to sue uh, foreign governments that may have been involved in uh, in those acts of terrorism, um, and so basically, so it doesn't apply solely to 9/11 in Saudi Arabia, but that's like right. primarily how it would be used. Yeah, TPP um, will let the countries sue the companies that are or for other countries for screwing up their profit, but we can't sue other countries for killing our people. Um, and and that's yeah. and that's coming to uh, when is that coming due? To well, so it passed it passed the Senate uh, recently, and then it passed in the House, I think, on Friday. Um, and so now it's to it's on Obama's desk. Um, uh, and I, you know, he he threatened at some point to veto it. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, I was kind of doubtful actually that it would that it would pass through through the you know through the legislature. And yeah, the, and surprising. <laughs> it is surprising, and you know. Uh, I'm not going to speculate on the reasons. It's right. really outside outside of my focus and my, my expertise to, to speculate on the reasons why he's going to veto why he would veto it. But um, I think uh, on the one hand, there could be some good outcomes from this, and then there could be some not so good outcomes from it. You know, from this focus on Saudi Arabia, uh, perhaps if there is litigation against Saudi Arabia, it would result in a discovery process right. uh, that would just unearth all of this evidence that would. Um, implicate you know the saudis uh that that were that were apparently involved in 9-11 as well as uh, as well as many other people and and 
perhaps closer to home if that's if that's where the truth lies. Uh, that's that's exactly what I was hoping you would get to with your answer, actually. So, uh, Richard Green, uh, Richard, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Ted. Oh, no, no, take, take it away. Richard, Richard Green, uh, co-host, go ahead. Do uh, you have a question? Oh, unmute yourself. There we are. Uh, you talked a little bit. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, you talked a little bit about some of the pushback that you got. I'm curious, what are some of the more like uh, what what you said that, you know, the 11 percent voted for the resolution, but that the percentage of people that kind of agree with the sentiment may be much larger of the people that don't agree. What's more, one of the more sound arguments that comes out of like legitimate objections that you get from from them? If uh, just to play devil's advocate a bit. Yeah, well, let's at least start with Building 7 because that, that's what the resolution is about with the AIA. Uh, they will tend to argue that, well, the building was severely damaged by debris from the North Tower as well. Um, well, that's all fine and good. We, we actually don't know for sure exactly how much damage was sustained. There's not a lot of good photography of the south face of the building. But the, the NIST report... Uh, does says that the damage to the building actually had nothing to do with its collapse whatsoever. It did ignite the fires, but if you had exactly the same fires occurring in the building without any debris damage, it still would have come down due to those fires. So it is a solely fire-induced collapse, according to NIST. So if somebody puts forward the argument, well, there's all this damage, well, but that's just not the official story. So now you're making up your own story. Maybe that's true, but you got to prove it. Um, then they kind of talk about how long the fires lasted in the building. Um, yes, if you leave fires you know, to just travel through a building uh, for six hours, which usually doesn't happen, usually firefighters will be sent up to fight that fire. And that in itself is a strange occurrence that the FDNY decided not to fight the fires in that building. Um, and you get into that. There's a whole other thing to well, discuss. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. So let's, let's talk about that for a second. <laughs> um, okay, well... Why, why quickly, there was a, there was, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Finish well, up. To, to quickly wrap up that point, the fires were not in any particular area in building seven for more than like 45 minutes. So we talk about fires just going on forever and these raging fires. Um, there were not raging fires. They were, I'm not going to say relatively small, but they were not exceptional fires. Right. They, yeah. were, not, they were smaller than many large high rise fires that we've had. Dozens of buildings uh, in the last 50, 100 years. So. Mm -hmm. Before that's, or since? So that's the main pushback that we get um, from those people. They want to believe that these fires were just crazy. They want to believe that. Uh, we also say, oh, buildings, it wasn't designed properly. Um, there's no evidence whatsoever that it, was, that it wasn't designed properly. So people start to like come up with these explanations. Well, is it, what, it was actually it was actually reinforced, wasn't it? At when at some point when they took it over, they needed to actually add more uh, strength to it because you know, it was built on an, on a different building, another building uh, foundation. And yeah, uh, it was built on top of a Con Ed substation. Um, and, and it, so it had a little bit of, you know, unusual, you know, uh, many buildings have relatively unusual designs and you know construction but it was built on top of kind of substation i can't speak specifically to whether they they reinforce it at some point i don't i don't know about that right um the, was there a the, diesel fire was there a diesel tank explosion as far as you know there was there was not and that is a, now a part of the official story that diesel fuel fires had nothing to do with it and right. yet there was somebody who got up at last year's aia business meeting and said we already know what happened the diesel fuel fires brought it down and he's speaking in front of hundreds of architects like he should actually know what the official story is if he supports it. Right. Wow. Well, you know, 42% yeah. of the population didn't even know there was a third building that came down in a recent, yeah. in a recent poll. So this, that seems to be at the core of, of a lot of the, the distrust of the alternative theories or the suggestion that it wasn't fire that brought it down is just misinformation or ignorance or lack of information or complete information regarding what we know and what the official story was and is now. And yeah. so I find that very interesting. Yeah. I mean, we, we have a problem when, like, for example, this is, you're curious to know what is going on in the profession. Um, last year, we went to the Structural Engineering Summit, like last October, and there was about 400 structural engineers that go there. We spoke to about 100 of them. 25 of them signed our petition. Uh, but about half of them didn't know that a third building collapsed on 9-11. A skyscraper, a 47-story skyscraper, and these are structural engineers. So it's it's pretty mind-boggling. Like 
that would be, I mean, if, I, we all know that if that happened on any other day, it would be like insane. It would, you know, it would be like all over the news. It would be studied. It would be the most studied structural failure in history. That's um, like an, an NFL player not knowing who won the Super Bowl or something. Like yeah. that's part of their job is they should know stuff that happens to buildings. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very, very good metaphor. So, what, <laughs> so what's next, Ted? Wow, that's a good question. Um, we're, I wrestle with that question every day. Uh, that's kind of my job for architects and engineers. For because nobody true. wants to talk about this anymore, as far as I can tell. Certainly not the general public. And uh, once we, you know, uh, maybe you're right, maybe once this, another, this study comes out that actually t- completely refutes NIST and says, yes, there was a controlled demolition, maybe that meant people will go, oh, wait a minute, there's something more behind it. But here we are, 15 years, never-ending war, this is the 15th time that Obama has uh, reinstated the state of emergency. No question from uh, Congress. I know I hate to see, I hate to look like a conspiracy theory here, but they've got everything they want. And um, you know, <laughs> what what's gonna what's gonna what, how are we, if we even we have the evidence? Are we gonna be able to bring a case against anybody? Um, it's, it's a difficult question to, to answer. And that was sort of the, the main subject of this conference. The, the conference was called Justice in Focus. And so we had a lot of attorneys there, uh, some who are pretty famous attorneys who've done a lot of like public interest and you know, high profile cases uh, discussing what are, what are the most viable uh, avenues to bringing this case forward, either in a civil uh, suit or uh, through in the criminal uh, uh, judicial system. and. Um, you know, there, there's no there's no easy answer. They had different ideas. I think that there is a feeling that civil action would 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 be would be the most viable. Uh, you know, because with with trying to get you know you you could compile and package all this evidence and try to give it to a prosecutor, but getting a getting a uh, you know a DA or a federal prosecutor to actually do an investigation, you know, unlikely and to to impanel a grand jury is pretty unlikely in this current setting in this in the current yeah. context which, so, con- which continues um, which unabated yeah, yeah. And so i think a civil i think a civil action is we might see a civil action i think a civil action is on the horizon you have uh family members of 9-11 victims uh as uh, as an obvious class of right. plaintiffs and i one thing that we've really just started discussing recently is that you have actually thousands of of first responders and other mm. people that were down down near the world trade center site who are um, who are dying? Who, who have cancer or other illnesses related to the destruction of the buildings? And if you can prove that the destruction of the buildings was a controlled demolition and somebody had to, to had to have done it, they are the cause of the of all these people's illness. And and so the, these are this this is another possible class of plaintiffs. And you know, bringing a case like that forward, you're going to run into all sorts of obstacles that judges uh, are going to are going to throw at you unless you happen to get very lucky and have a good judge. Um, and, and so for it to, to be successful, we need to have a much, uh, much greater level of awareness and there needs to be a greater level of public support, uh, for, for, for this cause. And we, we know that there's, you know, I think there's a sort of a slowly growing awareness, a slowly growing openness to this. Um, but it's not fast enough. And, you know, right now, um, you know, in all likelihood, this, this will become another JFK where 50 years from now. Okay, you know, two thirds of the population believes that it was an inside job, um, but we don't want another JFK. Um, we want to bring this uh, to closure uh, sooner, and we want. Yes, they have gotten whoever did this got what they wanted. They got exactly what they wanted as as a result of of, of doing nine eleven. Um, but if we bring this to justice soon, say in the next five ten years. Mm. Um, it can still, it's not too late to have, for that to have a dramatic impact on the way that our country is governed and the, and, and a, a deep cultural shift, I think that would result from it. Um, and, and so whereas if it's 50, 75, hundred years from now that this is, you know, the popular opinion, then it won't mean anything. So, yeah. um, I, I, so we have to work on all fronts. Um, we have to continue doing what, what we're doing. It looks like the 9-11 Truth Movement is turning a corner in terms of involving uh, lawyers and in trying oh, to, yeah, right, to right, prosecute right. this case. Although ca- cases, a case already has been tried. You know, right. Uh, right. Bill Beal, uh, who represented April Gallup, a Pentagon survivor, um, they sued Dick Cheney, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, and General uh, Richard Myers uh, mm-hmm. back in 2007, 2008. 
Um, and and that's them. That, that got um, <laughs> that uh, that didn't go well for for Mr. Veal. Um, he hmm. was reprimanded by the courts. They called him uh, basically a crazy conspiracy theorist right. and, and threw out the case. So we we um, we we have to be very careful to for for a new case to not meet a similar fate. And we have to have a greater level of, of public awareness and, and interest in this issue. And so we're working every day to make that happen. It's an uphill battle. Sure. Um, sure. Chances are, 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 are small. Like, you know, and, but I continue to have hope. Otherwise, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. Um, and I also know that it's the right thing to be doing. So. Well, I, I, appreciate, I appreciate what you're doing. I certainly do that, uh, that you are um, still in the game and looking for answers. And um, I'm hoping that um, more people, more young people, you know, Eric and uh, Eric in your age and uh, and Rich's age, you know, that uh, they start to look at this again um, and not give up on the fact that, that there's some evidence that are that's really staring us in the face. And we don't really know what happened. And there's been no criminal investigation of the, one of the greatest crimes. Yeah, go ahead, Ted. Yeah, I, and I'm curious about that because I meet so many young people, like my cousin's age. My cousins were like 10 years younger than me, like 24, 25, and their friends, like, they all know about this. A lot of them do. Mm. Um, it's not like, but getting them, and they care. Like, one of my cousin's friends was like, oh, my God, I can't believe what you do. Like, amazing. Um, but, like, uh, they're not, a, they haven't really become a part of the 9-11 truth movement in a weird way. Like, the 9-11 truth movement is pretty much only comprised of people that were adults when 9-11 happened. Right. So uh, yeah. Dave and I had this conversation. I told him, uh, just to be completely honest, Alex Jones turned me off from the truth or movement, to, to be honest. Uh, that's kind of where, and, 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 you know, there's there's conspiracies behind Alex Jones in, in, in its own right. Um, but that's really what kind of turned me off is, you know, at first that he made a lot of uh, logical arguments and then, uh, you know, when you hear some of his other arguments about other things, it kind of made me want to distance myself from his arguments. Um, and I told Dave, it didn't mean that I didn't believe that there was more answers to be had. Um, and I, I think just today alone and, and the last week, just um, re-looking into all this, uh, it definitely has re-enlightened me and re-impassioned me. So that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, think people like Alex Jones, I think, you know, with... I don't believe in lizard people and you know, I didn't want to be identified as someone who believed in lizard people. And uh, so I think with, with people like you, Ted and Dave that are more logical and don't seem insane, like Alex does. Uh, I'm insane. I'm, I'm insane, but uh, I, love, I, love a good insane. Cons- I love a good conspiracy theory, but you know, we're trying, we're being sold a conspiracy theory. So, you know, it, all that is, all it is, is what, you know, what people agree on happen is no longer a conspiracy theory, even though it had to do with a bunch of people committing a crime, which is what a conspiracy is. So, uh, you know, we're, we are being uh, told to believe a conspiracy theory. And uh, a lot of people don't know exactly what, you know, the, the Building 7, what's that? Um, you know, we have to stay vigilant, <laughs> not, to, not to take a term from this global war on terror, which I don't think is going anywhere, Ted. So, you know, hopefully you're right. In five, ten years, uh, we're still going to be fighting this mythical, uh, you know, enemy uh, with no state actor uh, to go after globally. And, uh, you know, hopefully there will be at least still some interest in maybe getting back our democracy and our civil liberties, which seem to be at a loss at this point. So, Richard, any uh, any final comments or question? No, unmute. Been, I've been off today. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, I thought it was some very interesting stuff. And as of now, uh, I mean, I did a little bit of research going into this, and I mean, I I had uh, delved into the ideas that the 9/11 story wasn't complete or we weren't getting the truth. But obviously, as Eric just highlighted, had been kind of. Uh, pushed away due to the connections to other conspiracy theories and getting lumped in with that idea. And so, but now, as of now, and based off of what I had seen before, I, I'm going to need a very much better explanation from whoever's willing to give it about how uh, the World Trade Center 7 collapses due to fire. Because uh, I, I, I'm having a really hard time wrapping my head around how that could happen. And, and with your, yourself and the group that you're aligned with, having that many people that have that dissent and as you described the people that disagree with that dissent aren't really articulating a very sound argument against it and they're not they're not giving you a detailed explanation about how the you know this central uh, column 
was deformed in this way and caused this type of that that's not the type of case that you're getting in response. So as a result of that, uh, until I see some better evidence, I, I have to say that fire didn't bring down the World Trade Seven Center. Seven, Converted. In my opinion. In my opinion. <laughs> we did it, Eric. We convinced one. Ted, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah. Eric, any 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 uh, final comments or uh, questions for Ted? We're definitely gonna have to have you back, Ted. Uh, to, keep, love- to keep us updated because we're not going to, you know, this is this is some real science. We're going to get our physicist. We have a physicist and another yes, PhD candidate on board. So we need to get we need to get them here and uh, start talking to you again. So we'll we'll get updates from you. But go ahead, Eric. Uh, final comments or question. I'm just kind of happy right now because I feel almost. Um, oh, man, I can't find the word right now. Richard kind of put me off track a little bit with with what he said. I feel like I accomplished something for some reason. And I don't know why. <laughs> well, you know, we're trying to, this is, you know, this is a grassroots organization. We're, we're trying to find, you know, we're, we, we came together around politics. Uh, this has been something that I have been interested in, you know, since the day it happened. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I am heartened that there's real science going on. There's a real investigation going on, even though it's been thwarted and, and fought for, you know, fought against by everybody. Uh, and true, including people that just have had enough, we want to grieve, leave us alone kind of attitude. And that's where they got us. You know, that's where they got us. The big lie, you know, to quote, you know, somebody. But uh, um, I, I really hope that this is fruitful and we get some good hard evidence that are going to change some minds. Please come back, Ted. Let's talk about it some more. And uh, and we will keep track of, of the videos and all the releases. Uh, I will get all the links that we've talked about today uh, for videos, and I'll put it in the description. But really, thanks thanks very much. And uh, can you leave us with some parting words this, on this uh, 15th anniversary? Well, I, well, first off, I want to thank you and say that it's been very fun, and I would love to come back on. Um, you know, I, I want actually, it, it, this might sound funny, but I, this is not like, not, there are so many other important issues, right, besides 9-11. And I think one of the common misconceptions is that, like, 9-11 truth activists think that 9-11 is the only thing that matters. Like, everything stems from 9-11. It's this, like, super important issue. And, like, nothing else is that important. And there's so much other very serious stuff going on um, that are that is, um, you know, equal, similar importance. So I, I want to say that, you know. Um, but 9-11 is incredibly important. Um, it, it changed our world in a huge way. Um, and, and, and it's not too late to, to move, to move this world in, in a much better direction. If, if we can get to the bottom of what happened on 9-11, so that's pretty much it. Well, that's, uh, yeah, I pre- those are great, great words. And I'm right there with you. Hey, if we're here in 30 years with global warming, hopefully we'll have some answers. So, uh, you know, I, I look, I look forward, we look forward to some real answers. We really do. And I, we, you know, we do jest a little bit. And sometimes if you don't look at things in a humorous way, it's, that's sometimes a way to get information across, actually. Um, and uh, comedians can get away with a lot with humor. And I think that, um, you know, we, and if we don't laugh, we're going to cry. So we need to look at the truth. We need to be definitely have a perspective of what's going on. This crime really has dominoed into crime after crime after crime uh, with intervention around this planet. Whether it was a, a whether it just someone taking advantage of it by pulling out every law out of the book and passing Patriot Act one and two and the uh, uh, Military Commissions Act and let's get let's take out Iraq while we're at it. I mean, General Wesley Clark he outed the the conspiracy. Oh, we're going after Iraq. Oh, guess what? Now we're going to go after these seven countries. There's two left on the list, people, and uh, both of these guys are ready to take them out that are being elected. So this is this story is not over and it really all begins on that day when literally everything changed. So Ted, thank you very much. Appreciate all everything you're doing. Stay in touch. Um, and we'll see you next time. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you guys. Thanks for what you're doing. Uh, we're going to uh, actually, Ted, we're going to play that trailer uh, as we go out. We're going to play that trailer for Justice in Focus uh, and take a little break, and then we'll come back on the other side and uh, talk about what we heard from Mr. Walter. Thanks again, Ted. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. You too.
I was trying to make you a little bit smaller, but uh, uh, we're just going to... I wish I was a little bit smaller. <laughs> we're just going to come back the way that is there. Uh, so, yeah, we just... Uh, that was um, that was good information, I must say. Yes, it was. Uh, I am um, I'm heartened, as I said, by that uh, that movement and the uh, the fact that they are looking at this in a uh, unpartial way. It was as far as you know, uh, it's looking at it in, with a scientific method in 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 mind, as opposed to trying to paint it with you know the brush of who did this, who is behind it, why. You know, we can we can find that out once we get some hard evidence that the story is the real story isn't true. And we're not getting, we're not, we don't know what happened. And whatever happened, they've used it to completely destroy um, a lot and kill a lot of people. I think it's really smart to start with just the most basic question of, did fire bring down the WTC 7 building? And by asking just that simple question and by focusing on that and whether it's even possible, then if it's determined that it's not reasonably feasible for that, particularly not just any type of building collapse, but for that particular type of collapse to transpire as a result of uh, of fires and then the severity of the fires, whether there's any any reason to believe that they were as, as intense. So as he mentioned, you know, NIST mentioned at first that they, or that FEMA, I believe, or NIST mentioned at first that they thought that diesel tanks fires played a role, but that that idea had... Uh, had been gone by the the most recent or last version of NIST's uh, NIST's uh, version of what transpired, and so I think that's really wise by focusing just on that because looking at the information that's available, I don't see how they're how, how that how you're they're gonna how one could come up with a feasible scenario just off the one I was reading off the report. It it doesn't seem to make any sense. It seems very like it's missing something significant to explain itself. Uh, yeah. And they were just published actually in a physics magazine too, in an article um, <clears throat> in a um, no, very uh, notable physics magazine asking these questions, not only about building seven, but also about the, uh, the two twin towers. So I think Ted's right. I think if, if this, uh, if we get some hard evidence, uh, maybe it's going to, uh, you know, change some minds and maybe look elsewhere because yeah, I think those firemen, are going to be a little bit more pissed about um, what happened that day and how they were used, um, if that's the case. So um, I, I thank you guys for joining me in on this, and we're gonna we're gonna get Ted back for sure. We're going to get James Co uh, uh, Corbett on and uh, talk to him about his videos and his uh, his what he knows what's going on uh, lately about maybe the criminal investigation and who we really should be looking at. Uh, so we'll get him on. Uh, you know, he was really busy today and this was all last minute. So we are doing lots of interesting things here at uh, Project Sanity. Uh, we're trying, we are all over the country. We're grassroots, uh, we're citizen journalists and we are creating live programming. That's our plan is to create live programming like this uh, Tuesday night, uh, Tuesday afternoon, two Pacific, another episode of the robust opposition will be on. Uh, we're going to be in, uh, I'm getting a lot of people saying they like that name, by the way, guys. Oh, that's a good name. So, uh, we're the robust opposition will be, uh, will be, uh, active. Join the opposition on Tuesday, 2 PM. That'll be a live broadcast. Eric's going to help me on that, but I'll be in the streets of Beverly Hills in front of Seth McFarland's house, uh, protesting Hillary Clinton's fundraiser. And, uh, and also uh, part of the No DAPL uh, at Day of Action, which uh, we hear uh, Bernie Sanders apparently is going to be at the action in um, New York, uh, Washington. I think it's Washington on the same day. So Tuesday is also a big day of action for the uh, No Dakota Access Pipeline, which, of course, we talked about a little bit that it's been stalled, um, but it's probably not over. Uh, but uh, there'll be no violence probably now there for the rest of the t election season anyway. And um, which is probably what they want in the grand scheme of things. So uh, uh, we're going to have lots of programming. Of course, we have our live show, right, Richard, on Thursday night. And uh, are you going to you going to show up this week or what? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll be there. And uh, I might actually be partially inspired by this uh, this broadcast that Dave put together here with the World Trade Center to talk a little bit more about the political fallout of 9-11 and what it's meant in the last 15 years. And, and it's huge. One of the things, I'm um, sorry to yeah. interrupt, but one of the things I wanted to just bring up when Ted was on is that the new move, of course, and you know, we talk about these people that weren't born 
uh, on or were born on 9/11. That's the new psyop, the new propaganda tool. Is we're gonna we're gonna pull all the kids that were born on that day and feed them the the narrative and get them to go out and go forward. So this is part of it. This is all part of it. So I'm glad you're gonna take a look. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and definitely. And and what's that? What has it meant for our Middle East policy? And what what have we gotten for 15 years of intervening? What have we gotten, indeed? Uh, Nothing. Now it looks like a lot of uh, dead uh, military members, a lot of dead, a lot of dead civilians, which uh, Benjamin pointed out a long a while back, back uh, when Bernie was still in the race and everything, that Trump was pretty much one of the only candidates on either side to mention that you know these wars kill hundreds of thousands of civilians. And people that aren't engaged, that aren't part of this violence, that aren't part of this, and whether they they're part of a belief system that maybe uh, have antithetical views to some of the things that we hold dear in America or not, yeah. is separate from whether they deserve to get a bomb dropped on their on their children for it. And uh, I think it's it's really important to think about not just the damage that was caused to us, but what what have we done in response, and what does that make? How does that make us look? to some Joe Smo who doesn't watch the news that they don't get in their country and and just experiences America from the their first person perspective. Well, it's the response uh, that we do is uh, you know it has to be overwhelming shock and awe they've called it but it continues uh, with the drone program, you know, with the the launch of the drone program some would say on 9/11. Uh, oh, but I um, just also uh, the they imagine it's not a coincidence, but the siege was airing uh, with Denzel Washington, which d- it was in 1998. You mentioned and that. talks it talks a little bit about uh, Islamic terrorism before it was a thing, basically. If for as it was after the World Trade Center bombing, but that didn't get a lot of play or a lot of popularity. You know, terrorists were still usually Russian or right. uh, Eastern European of some sort, and so uh, it was one of the one of the big blockbusters that came out on that. But it ta- one of the scenes in there, you can probably find it on YouTube where he talks about the erosion of our civil liberties and that by by torturing, by doing these things, that's their winning and that they've already won. And this was before it all happened. And so uh, we, I've heard that reiterated since then. And it's just, yeah. it was, it seemed oddly prescient. Well, you know what I think, you know, along those lines, Eric, I'll get you in here too, though. But, uh, uh, you know, they talk about how Pearl Harbor came out literally the, the summer before. And uh, that was actually, might be part of it, the, the PSYOP. And then, you know, now what, what's come out recently, Argo, which is about taking out Iran and being, you know, and demonizing Iran. You know, that's one of the theories. But, then, and, you know, so uh, is this all part of a giant CIA PSYOP and uh, our government will uh, uh, kill 3,000 civilians? Might have been, they might have been willing to do more. Maybe, uh, you know, uh, they got lucky or they didn't. Maybe they wanted more. I don't know. Uh, but they certainly used that tragedy more than any truther has ever used that tragedy. I mean, the, our government has used 9-11, and you just look at Giuliani's tape, look at all that tape, you know, of his whole run-up in 2008. Our government and, our, and these bastards have used 9-11 for more damage than would ever happen than any truther asking for a freaking little, some evidence. You know, so to say we're un-American at any level, being a, someone who's looking for the truth of what really happened on the crimes of that day, is, that's unpatriotic. So there. <laughs> yeah, I I actually got to take off, guys. But All one right, thing cool. I, I wanted to say is uh, that regardless of what you believe, and, and at risk of sounding like I'm uh, promoting RT America, um, we we really Russian need to television? question more. Yeah, we we really need to question more. Um, we can't just believe what we're told. Um, you don't have to believe anything, um, but don't come to your own conclusions until you have done your research. Absolutely. And I just one of the things that, as I mentioned, you know, about how the perspective of the those. See you later, Eric. Appreciate you joining us. Uh, one of the about the perspective from those in the Middle East and and reflecting on our perspective is one of the justifications we often give for collateral damage uh, in in military conflicts is that well, you know, they they are especially on the right. You'll see a lot of this. Well, they believe this. They believe that. They think that you know, uh, you know, this is bad. That is bad. And or that they think the United States is, you know, doing X, Y, or Z to their country, and when we're really not, and it's like they need to be informed. It's like so it's on us if we don't if if we don't want them to use that same justification against us as collateral damage if they target civilians or 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 if they consider us combatants by merely partic- being participants in the American uh, d- democratic system, 
it, it's our job to ask the questions that need to be asked so that we know what actually happened. So that we're not just blindly following our government telling us a story about these are the bad people and this is why they hate us and this is why you hate them. Because they're getting the same thing from their government and if we expect them to not just swallow what their government's telling them whole, that the United States is the source of all their problems, right. then we can't accept our government's uh, explanation that the source of so much turmoil in the world is because of the people or the governments in the Middle East. Yeah, exactly. We can't do it. We'd never be able to do it. Like Bob Barr said, oh, I'd never be able to do it. I should play that one. But Richard, thank you so much, brother. Project thank Sanity, you. subscribe to the channel. Get notifications when we go live because we're going to do more live programming. Uh, we're going to set up a regular uh, news blast every day, a bit of sanity. That's coming, we swear. So lots of things happening. We're still working on our very special thing happening up in Washington. So subscribe to the channel. I'm DC, Dave Conan at uh, Our Revolution TV. You can find me on Twitter at also OurRevolution.TV. Richard Green? Uh, uh, you can find me at Progressive Green. Uh, no E at the end of Progressive. And then just Progressive Green on Twitter. And uh, just... You should make sure to check out projectsanity.org, and that'll lead you back to our YouTube space. Subscribe so you can find out when we're doing those shows that Dave was mentioning. And uh, just thank all of you so much for uh, your patience. And uh, now that our credibility has been demolished, hopefully you guys still continue to tune in. Yeah, yes, we're complete. Our credibility is completely demolished now that we're truthers. <laughs> And so, yeah, hopefully you can keep us in esteem and uh, continue to tune in and share with your friends, family, and other people that you think might be interested in what we've got to say. Thanks so much. Awesome, Richard. Thank I got a P. Dave for uh, doing all the work you did to oh, get this together. Hey, man, my, my pleasure, Rich. Thanks for joining in. Uh, I do have to pee, so I'm going to put you out on this video we watched. Uh, thank you all for joining in, and uh, we'll see you next time on Project 9-11. At approximately 5.20 p.m. on September 11, 2001, World Trade Center Building 7 collapsed in 6.5 seconds from normal office fires, according to the government's final report. World Trade Center 7 collapsed because of fires fueled by office furnishings. It did not collapse from explosives or from fuel oil fires. Later, the government finally admitted that Building 7 collapsed at the rate of freefall after trying to deny it. So what's wrong with a building in free fall? What is free fall? It's just like taking your car keys out and just dropping them. That's how fast the building came down for over 100 feet. This is high school physics. A building cannot do free fall with 40,000 tons of structural steel in its structural system without it being blown up. The only way that a building can accelerate as it collapses is by having pre-engineered, precisely timed, and precisely placed explosives. In other words, controlled demolition. Normal office fires not only dropped a steel-framed skyscraper for the first time in history, and did so at freefall, according to the government's report. They also burned hot enough to create the molten metal observed at ground zero. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel, like molten down. steel running down the channel rails like you're in a foundry. In an office fire, you cannot generate enough heat to melt steel. So if you have a flame at 750 degrees, you can hold that flame under a steel beam forever and you'll never reach a high enough temperature to bend steel, let alone melt it. First of all, let's go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of molten, molten steel. Like lava. Like, like, like lava. From a volcano. Um, I know of absolutely nobody, and no eyewitness who said so, nobody who's produced it. John Gross categorically denied their observations. He not only ignored evidence, he denied evidence. The government acknowledged that Building 7's collapse was unprecedented. Engineers were also stunned. Yet somehow, news networks and many others knew it was going to happen. CNN reported the collapse an hour before it happened. We are getting information now that one of the other buildings, Building 7 in the World Trade Center complex is on fire and has either collapsed or is collapsing. And a few blocks away. Oh, Lord. Did you hear that? Keep your eye on that building. It'll be coming down. Oh. The building is about to blow up. Moving back.
Now, more on the latest building collapse in New York. The BBC even reported the collapse in detail, live from New York, over 20 minutes before it happened, with Building 7 still standing in the background. Immediately after Building 7's collapse, FDNY Lieutenant David Rastuccio had this to say. We had heard reports that the building was unstable and that it eventually would either come down on its own or it would be taken down. CBS veteran anchorman Dan Rather and others also had their first impressions, which were only broadcast on that tragic day. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. And I turned in time to see uh, what looked like uh, a skyscraper implosion. It looked like it had been done by a demolition crew. The whole thing just collapsing down on itself. You don't need to be an engineer or an architect to see what happened to those buildings. The most obvious hypothesis for anyone looking at the films is that the buildings came down because there was very carefully controlled demolition with high explosives that had been planted weeks if not months before. 9-11 claimed thousands of lives and touched millions more. It led us into two wars and was used to scale back our civil liberties and invade our privacy. But many people are beginning to question what we were told and we are demanding answers. So how do we do it? We find our own voices and then we raise them, together. There's been hatred, there's been fear, but there's been no justice for the people who were killed on that day. We must have an inquiry to find out what really happened. The official accounts of 9-11 are false. This is so important that you've got, to, you've got to put your usual sources on hold for a while. You take it slowly, just slowly digest it, slowly accept it. When the most likely hypothesis in, in the case of Building 7 wasn't even mentioned. They didn't talk about Building 7. Nobody mentioned it. And it wasn't hit by planes. So why did it go down? What I want to persuade you to do is look into it, right? And make up your own mind. Rethink 9-11. Rethink 9-11! Perth, Australia supports. Join us and millions around the world who are now learning about the evidence and uniting to rethink 9-11.